What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about antihypertensive medications. There's a lot to go over. But what I want you guys to do is, if you guys do benefit from this video and you guys do like it, it really helps you to understand this concept, please support us. And I'm telling you, the best way that you can do that is by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and also subscribing. Also, if you guys really want some amazing notes and illustrations that our engineer team has compiled, go down in the description box below. We have a link to our website where you guys can check that out. All right, without further ado, let's start talking about antihypertensives, though. So, when we talk about antihypertensives, what I want to do is I want to break them into four categories, okay? And I want to go within these four categories, I want to talk about the mechanism of action, I want to talk about the drugs that are in that category, and then we'll also discuss some of the adverse effects that they may have, because I think it makes sense to cover them when we talk about their mechanism of action. All right, so these four categories is sympatholytics, diuretics, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone inhibitors, and then lastly is your vasodilators. All right, sympatholytics, they're inhibiting the sympathetic nervous system. That's the whole concept, right? Now, we're gonna go through these in a couple different ways. Now, the first one here is, we're gonna talk about these centrally acting drugs. So there's two central acting drugs that I want you guys to know. And these two central acting drugs are called clonidine. So one is called clonidine, and the other one is called alpha methyl dopa. Now, these two drugs are really interesting. Okay, and what do I mean by they're centrally acting? You see these uh, nerves coming from the thoracic part of the spinal cord? This is your sympathetic nerves. And these sympathetic nerves that go from the thoracic part of your spinal cord, they actually go and release norepinephrine onto the heart and onto the blood vessels. Right? And whenever they release norepinephrine onto the heart, we know that it increases heart rate, it increases contractility. We'll talk about that a little bit in a second. It also works on the arteries to squeeze the heck out of them and increase resistance, and it squeezes the veins to increase blood return to the right heart. So all of these things are working to, in general to increase blood pressure in that concept. Well, if I give a drug that has the ability to maybe suppress the central drive that causes the sympathetic nervous system to release norepinephrine, right? So here's these thoracic spinal cord nerves. They're releasing from these nerves lots and lots of norepinephrine. And the norepinephrine will work on the heart and it'll work on the blood vessels. And what it's designed to do is, this central process here, is that when you have an increase in norepinephrine, it's going to increase heart rate, it's going to increase contractility, it's going to increase systemic vascular resistance, and it's going to increase preload. And all of these things, if you think about it, you increase heart rate, you increase cardiac output, you increase contractility, you increase cardiac output, you increase resistance, you increase blood pressure, you increase preload, you increase cardiac output. And then we know that the formula is that blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. You increase resistance, you increase blood pressure. You increase cardiac output, you increase blood pressure. So what I need to do is I need to give a drug like these ones, clonidine and alpha methyl dopa, and what they will do is they have the capability of inhibiting all of these processes. They can relax the arteries, that reduces systemic vascular resistance, they relax the veins, that reduces preload, they can inhibit the actual heart from beating fast and contracting fast, that'll reduce the heart rate and the contractility. All of these things will reduce cardiac output, reduce systemic vascular resistance, and reduce blood pressure. Now you're probably wondering, okay, they do that, but how? These nerves, when they release norepinephrine onto the heart and the blood vessels, they work through particular processes, right? We already talked about that. But here, in the central nervous system, there's this central drive for the sympathetic nervous system. So what I wanna do is I wanna take like this particular area here, and I kinda wanna zoom on it, because this is the thing that's really driving your sympathetic flow. So if I have an ability to inhibit this process right here, I may lose the sympathetic flow or outflow to the heart and the blood vessels, right? So let's say that we take that and we zoom in on it, okay? So this right here is gonna be this type of interaction. Now here this neuron has vesicles containing norepinephrine. And when this nerve is stimulated, right, it fuses with the cell membrane and starts plucking out norepinephrine into the synapse. Norepinephrine will then bind on to these receptors and then stimulate flow via the sympathetic outflow. So it'll stimulate sympathetic nervous system outflow. Now imagine, I give a drug like clonidine. Clonidine is really interesting because what clonidine will do is it'll bind onto these receptors in the synaptic terminal. These are called alpha-2 receptors. Clonidine is a alpha-2 receptor 
in, uh, agonist. So it's going to stimulate the alpha-2 receptor. Now you're probably like, okay, that's interesting. When this clonidine stimulates the alpha-2 receptor, so it's going to stimulate this particular receptor, this receptor is responsible for inhibiting norepinephrine from fusing with the cell membrane. Then what happens to the norepinephrine that gets released? It reduces. What happens to the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system? It becomes inhibited. You lose the sympathetic outflow. If you lose the sympathetic outflow, what happens to the norepinephrine release towards the heart? It's reduced. What happens to the ability to stimulate the heart rate? You lose that. You inhibit the actual heart rate from going up. You inhibit the contractility. What happens to the outflow on the arteries? You lose the ability to constrict, so they relax. And what happens to the venal constriction? You lose it, so therefore it relaxes. And you see how this drug has the ability to do all of these things. Now, clonidine is, believe it or not, even though you would think, holy son of a gun, it does so many things. This has to be like a first-line agent. <laughs> believe it or not, it's not a first-line agent. It's not commonly utilized, to be honest with you. It's more of like a third-line agent if you really need it. The real true indication of why we would use this drug, and we talked about it a lot more in the adrenergic uh, agonist lecture, is that this is good for kind of like a patient who has withdrawal symptoms. So the patient who's just recently been on a bender on alcohol, benzos, or some type of other th situation, like um, usually alcohol, benzodiazepines are the big ones that are usually the, the primary problems are opioids, and they withdraw. And when they withdraw, they develop a massive tachycardia, they develop hypertension, they squeeze on their blood vessels. So if I give this drug, when I actually inhibit that sympathetic outflow, I could treat the withdrawal symptoms. So that's the true, really only indication of when we would give clonidine, is that this drug can really be good in situations of withdrawal symptoms. So withdrawal, and particularly uh, withdrawal from specific medications, because what this does is when you withdraw, you have a massive sympathetic outflow because you've been suppressing that outflow with depressants like alcohol, such as benzodiazepines, such as opioids. And when you remove that suppression, now you have nothing but sympathetic outflow. And so you can inhibit that by giving clonidine. That's the really the only true indication. But because it has the ability to suppress your central kind of norepinephrine drive, it also may lead to sedation. So one of the adverse effects to watch out for with clonidine is watch out for sedation. It can make the patient a little bit more sedated. All right, alpha methyl dopa doesn't actually work through the alpha-2 receptors. What it does is alpha methyl dopa is an interesting drug here. So imagine here's alpha methyl dopa. It goes through the pathway that's used to make norepinephrine. And what it does is it actually inhibits you from actually truly making norepinephrine. So in order to be able to make norepinephrine, you know, you need tyrosine and then L-dopa and then dopamine and then norepinephrine. The alpha methyl dopa kind of alters the synthesis of norepinephrine. And so then you have less norepinephrine in these vesicles, less norepinephrine released, and less sympathetic outflow because of that. So it's a pretty interesting drug. And really the only indication of why we would give this drug, we'll talk about a little bit later, is pregnancy. Uh, one particular thing that is weird with this drug is that it may actually cause a positive Coombs test. And so you may see that if a patient develops like a little bit of anemia and you send off a what's called a Coombs test, they may come back Coombs test positive, which may make you think about an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. But this is one particular category of drugs. So one category of drugs for the sympatholytics I'm going to put here, let's do it in pink so that we see it here, is your central acting drugs. And again, this is clonidine and alpha methyl dopa. They work to suppress, they're working right here, to suppress the central sympathetic outflow. So they reduce the norepinephrine being released on the heart and on the blood vessels. So it inhibits heart rate, inhibits contractility, inhibits arterial vasoconstriction, and inhibits venoconstriction. All of these things do the following. That's the whole concept here because we're inhibiting this massive release of norepinephrine. All right. Beautiful. Let's come to the next part of the drugs for sympatholytics. The next thing is that we have beta receptors that are present on the heart. We know that that's the primary receptors, right? So if we look here, let's say that these are these sympathetic neurons right here. So these are the sympathetic neurons. And again, what are they pumping out here? They're pumping out what type of molecule? Noroepinephrine. So they're pumping out norepinephrine. And you know, there's another uh, molecule, another Technically hormone neurotransmitter that's also released from the sympathetic nervous system is epinephrine because your sympathetic nervous system also stimulates the adrenal medulla and pumps out epinephrine. But nonetheless, norepinephrine is released from these nerves. 
When norepinephrine is released from these nerves onto the heart, in order for them to exert their effect, they need a particular receptor. You know what this receptor is? It's a son of a gun, it's an interesting receptor. This is the beta receptors. What are these receptors here? These blue little things popping off of these cells are called beta-1 receptors. What is this one? This is a beta-1 receptor. In order for norepinephrine to exert its effect, so we already inhibited norepinephrine release, the central uh, suppression, which inhibited norepinephrine release. That was these two drugs. But what if norepinephrine is still released, how can we block its effect on the heart? Mm. So we can give particular drugs that will block the beta-1 receptor. They'll bind onto the beta-1 receptor and prevent norepinephrine. They'll be like, hey, get out of here. You can't bind here. What are those drugs? Not hard to imagine here. The second category of drugs that we're going to be discussing here, let's put them over here. Second category of drugs is going to be beta blockers. But I wanna be very, very specific, okay? So beta blockers. And really these are cardio selective. So mainly these are primary beta one blockers. Now, what these drugs will do is, if we take the two cells of the heart, so we have here your SA node, your AV node, your bundle of his, your bundle branches, and then um, from there we uh, you go into your Purkinje system, right? All of those things are controlling your, the conduction of electrical activity. On those cells, these black cells here on the heart, that's your nodal cells, they have beta-1 receptors. And then here on the red cells here, the contractile portion, the ones that actually squeeze and pump blood out of the heart, those ones also have beta-1 receptors. So if I give a beta blocker, what I'm going to be doing is, I'm going to block norepinephrine from being able to exert its effect, and I'm gonna produce an opposing effect. I'm going to inhibit the nodal cell from being able to fire. And what that's going to do is that's going to suppress the patient's heart rate. That's going to drop their cardiac output and then subsequently it's going to drop their blood pressure. Oh man, that's good. I'm going to also give this particular drug these beta blockers. So this is going to, these beta blockers will inhibit the nodal cell from firing, but it'll also inhibit the actual contractile cell from squeezing. So then because of that, you decrease contractility. And if you decrease contractility, what you know about that is that that drops stroke volume and then subsequently cardiac output and that drops blood pressure. So this is the way that we could treat a patient's hypertension by reducing the amount of blood that actually leaves the heart. And that would be the job of these beta blockers. Now there's many different agents here. Some of these that are very particular that I want you guys to know is what's called atenolol. So atenolol is a commonly utilized one. Another one is called bisoprolol, bisoprolol. Another one is called esmolol, very commonly utilized one, especially in IV formulations and hypertensive emergencies. And another one is called metoprolol. Now these are the most commonly utilized ones that you're gonna be seeing, particularly for the beta-1 blockers. There is other ones that are non-selective, like propanolol and natalol, but we don't commonly utilize that in that particular situation. They do have some beta-1 blockade, but I want you to remember these primary ones here. Okay, that's our beta blockers. Now, one of the things that I want you to think about here, don't be confused with this. These drugs we're gonna talk about, they're very commonly used in a lot of comorbid conditions. But if I'm giving a drug that has the ability to drop the patient's heart rate, what's a potential adverse effect out of this? It's not hard to imagine, my friends. Adverse effects that you really want to be careful with with these drugs is that you can drop the heart rate down too much. What is that called? Bradycardia. So watch out for bradycardia for these particular drugs. The other thing that you want to be careful of is that they can really drop your contractility. And so if they reduce the contractility, they can actually drop the patient's blood pressure. Where you really, if a patient already has a weak heart and it's not getting a good cardiac output, and then you drop the cardiac output even more by dropping their contractility, that could put them at risk of cardiogenic shock. And that's the patients who have weak hearts already. So watch out for hypotension with the potential of it even causing shock. In what patient population? Watch out for this in patients with decompensated heart failure. I'm gonna be DHF, decompensated heart failure. Do not give this to these patients, you will kill them, potentially. All right, the other thing with these drugs, <laughs> you know when the patient's hypoglycemic, you know when they're hypoglycemic, so let's say that your sugar drops down to like 25, right, okay? And when your sugar drops naturally, what your body does is says, hey, 
hey, sugar's low, my, my cells ain't, ain't feeling too well. And so because of your sympathetic nervous system goes into hyperdrive and it tries to let you know, hey man, something is not right and it makes you tachycardic, it makes you a little bit kind of diaphoretic and so it makes you aware that something is not right and then you should check your sugar levels if you, if you have diabetes. When you give a beta blocker, you block the tachycardic, the uh, hypertensive, you block the diaphoretic type of response, that sense of impending doom, all of those things that come from the sympathetic response from hypoglycemia, you don't have. And so because of that, this can really blunt that effect. And so you wanna watch out for what's called hypoglycemia unawareness. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. All right, that's our beta blockers. Okay, the next category here is, if we look here on the arteries and on the veins, they have another type of receptor. So here, this is your arteries here, so I'm just gonna denote that this is gonna be the arterial system coming from that left heart, and then here is going to be the venous system going back to the right heart. What I wanna do is, I wanna take some particular cells from the vein, a particular cells from the artery, and zoom in on them here. So here's an arterial smooth muscle cell, here's a venous smooth muscle cell. And remember, they all have sympathetic innervation. We talked about that. This is those adrenergic neurons, and what are they pumping out? What are they pumping out again? I've already told you this, you guys should know this, right? Norepinephrine, they're pumping out norepinephrine. So we suppress the norepinephrine release from Clonidine alpha methyl dopa. There is other drugs out there, we just don't use them, called reserpine, and there's some other ones out there as well that we just don't use them, like ganglion blockers, et cetera. But if we inhibit the norepinephrine release, all right, that would be the clonidine alpha methyl dopa. We can block the beta-1 receptors. Guess what? Guess what these receptors are on the arteries and veins? Alpha-1 receptors. These are called your alpha-1 receptors that are present both on the arterial smooth muscle cells and alpha-1 receptors present on the venous smooth muscle cells. So if I give a drug, hmm, guess what this drug category would be? Alpha blockers. Hmm. Man, we good. So if I give a drug category like an alpha blocker, what's the benefit of giving alpha blockers? So alpha blockers is gonna be my third category of drug. Okay, third category drug. Alpha blockers are gonna be interesting because if I give a drug like an alpha blocker, what they're gonna do is they're going to block the effect of norepinephrine and epinephrine from binding on to these alpha-1 receptors on the veins and on the arteries. The effect on the artery is that you're going to relax the smooth muscle. It's going to inhibit the smooth muscle from contracting, right? It inhibits the GQ process. And because of that, it'll actually cause the muscles to relax. If they relax, the entire vessel will undergo vasodilation. So if it relaxes, it undergoes vasodilation. And if it vasodilates, it drops your systemic vascular resistance. And that will subsequently drop your blood pressure based upon the equation that we just talked about here. Woo, mama. That's one way. The other one is the venous smooth muscle. I can inhibit this one. So I can inhibit this one from contracting and I can inhibit this one from contracting. So I'm gonna block norepinephrine and epinephrine binding here. And that's going to cause this one to, same thing. It's gonna relax. This is going to venodilate, but here's where it's different. When veins dilate, these are supposed to, now naturally, think about what they do when they squeeze. When they squeeze, they pump blood up into the right heart which improves preload, the amount of volume that's coming to the right heart or the heart in general during, diastole, di, during diastole. If I relax it, what happens to my, my preload? I drop it. If I drop my preload, I'll subsequently drop my cardiac output. And if I drop my cardiac output, I'll drop my blood pressure. Oh man. So alpha blockers, have the ability to drop your systemic vascular resistance, which can drop your arterial blood pressure, and venodilate, which will reduce the preload to the heart and reduce the stroke volume cardiac output and drop the blood pressure. What are some names of these particular drugs? Alpha blockers, so here's the thing. With alpha blockers, there's actually two types. There is selective, selective, and then there is, uh, let's call these non-selective, <laughs> selective. Now with the selective types, selective types, this is gonna be those ones that only block the alpha one. They only block the alpha one receptor. Non-selective means it could, buy, it could actually inhibit the alpha one and the alpha two receptors, okay? The selective ones are gonna be things like prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, 
things of that nature. They, they usually end in the zosin, okay? There's also tamsulosin as well, but these are particular drugs that we can give. Now, here's what I want you to think about. When you give these particular drugs that really dilate the arteries, okay, they dilate the arteries. When you dilate the arteries, what's it gonna do to your systemic vascular resistance? We already talked about this. We said that when you dilate, you reduce the systemic vascular resistance. Now, what's really interesting about this is when you drop BP, there's a, there's kind of like a natural reflex. Do you guys know that? That whenever you actually have a drop in blood pressure, what this does is that stimulates your baroreceptors that goes and sends the signals to your medulla. Your central nervous system says, hey, hey, <laughs> BP's low, we gotta increase that heart rate. And it sends an increased sympathetic outflow which increases your heart rate. What is that called? That's called reflex tachycardia. So these patients who have arterial vasodilators, watch out for what's called reflex tachycardia as a response to dilating the arteries and then reducing resistance, reducing blood pressure, creating a reflex compensatory tachycardia. The non-selective agents, these are gonna be interesting drugs. We don't commonly utilize these. I've talked about them in the adrenergic antagonist lecture, but this is going to be fentolamine. So fentolamine and phenoxybenzamine. If you guys remember, we briefly talked about these. The true indications of why you would really give these is if a patient has a hypertensive crisis. So if they have a hypertensive crisis and it's really secondary to something like what's called a pheochromocytoma or it's due to a monoamine oxidases um, that are in monoamine oxidase inhibitors plus they're taking like tyramine from like cheese or wine. You guys know all that stuff. We, we could potentially utilize these drugs to be able to treat that process. However, there is other drugs that you can utilize in those situations. But that's the big things to think about with your alpha blocker. So, so far we have centrally acting clonidine alpha methyl dopa, okay? We have beta blockers, cardio selective. They primarily inhibit the beta one, okay? And that's gonna be these particular drugs here. And then we talked about the alpha blockers. Now, one more thing, one more thing. When you actually dilate veins, here's another potential complication. So one potential adverse effect here is reflex tachycardia from dilating the arteries. But what if you dilate veins? When you dilate veins, here's another thing, interesting thing. When you dilate veins, another thing is that you reduce your preload, okay, when you venodilate. When you reduce preload, you reduce stroke volume, cardiac output, and reduce blood pressure. What's interesting about this is that if a patient who is very preload dependent, an older individual who goes from a seated position to a standing position, or goes from a supine to a seated position, when they move, they automatically have a fluid shift where blood should increase and go back to the right heart, improve their preload, their cardiac output, their blood pressure. But if those patients who you just took away their preload dependency because you venodilated them, now when they go to get up, they have no blood coming to their right heart because you dilated them, you reduce their venous return. So you drop their cardiac output and you drop their blood pressure and they develop, oh, orthostatic hypotension. So watch out for that for the venodilation effect. So this would be from the venodilation effect where you can cause orthostasis. Beautiful, okay. You thought we were done, we're not. There's one more. One more category here that's really interesting here. This one we're gonna sneak here in the middle. And this fourth category, believe it or not, we've already discussed. And this is a mixed blocker. This is a mixed blocker. So these are alpha and beta blockers. So they have the capabilities of blocking the alpha receptors in the arteries and veins. They also have the ability to block the beta receptors on the nodal cells and the contractile cells. So they have all of the similar types of effects. They may have these potential adverse effects. They may have these potential adverse effects. Generally not the reflex tachycardia. Why? Because they suppress the actual heart rate. So generally you may see bradycardia. Not as common to see the uh, reflex tachycardia from these two agents. All right, so there's two particular agents here for the alpha blockers and beta blockers. One is called labetalol, and the other one is a really interesting drug called carvedilol. 
These are two particular agents that we can give. And again, you're gonna see all the same similar side effect profile, more particularly the bradycardia. You can see hypotension, right? Because it can really drop the patient's blood pressure because it can vasodilate and beta block. And it can cause hypoglycemia and awareness. On top of that, it may cause a little bit of orthostasis, but there's one more thing. These, they can bind to beta one and beta two. So because they can bind onto beta two, guess what's a potential adverse effect, my friends? It can bind onto the beta two receptors in the bronchioles, on the bronchial smooth muscle. And when it binds onto the beta two receptors in the bronchial smooth muscle, guess what it can do? It can cause bronchospasm. So there's beta two receptors and labetalol and carvedilol don't mind that binding to that one. And if you stimulate that one, you will cause bronchospasm, sorry. So generally, Sorry, beta-2 receptors, if you stimulate them, they'll actually bronchodilate. But these are beta blockers. So they'll inhibit the beta-2 receptor. And if you inhibit the beta-2 receptor, you lose the ability to bronchodilate and therefore cause bronchospasm. So this may be another adverse effect that you would see from carvedilol or labetalol. Not as much so from metoprolol, esmolol, basoprolol, or atenolol. Okay, we've talked about some patholytics. A lot so far. Let's come down, talk about diuretics and how they also are utilized in hypertension. What are those drugs and some adverse effects? All right, so next category, diuretics. Now diuretics are really interesting and why would we use it? You're probably like, Zach, why would I use it for hypertension? We'll talk about why we would use them, but there is three particular categories of diuretics. Now the whole basic concept of why we would use diuretics in the treatment of patients with hypertension is relatively straightforward. And the concept of it is, is that when you give a particular diuretic, what a diuretic is doing is it's inhibiting sodium and water retention. So it's really inhibiting the kidneys from being able to retain any sodium and water. So any of the sodium, there's gonna be less sodium and then subsequently less water. Now you're probably like, okay, why is that potentially beneficial? Well, now that I actually went and I peed out a lot of this sodium and water, so now I peed out lots of sodium, I peed out lots of water, lots of this is in my urine now, I'm going to effectively decrease the amount of sodium and water within my bloodstream. What is that equivalent to? That's equivalent to blood volume. So now by giving a diuretic, I'm going to decrease my blood volume. If I decrease blood volume, I decrease the amount of blood that is able to be returned to the right heart. Therefore, I reduce preload because I'm reducing my venous return. If I reduce preload, I reduce stroke volume and cardiac output, and I reduce stroke volume and cardiac output, I reduce blood pressure. And so you see why this may be potentially beneficial. And really, the only situations where it would be beneficial is if the blood volume is like really high. And what kind of conditions would blood volume be high that actually you may benefit from pulling some of that sodium and water off? Really, volume overload states. And so you may find that the true indication of giving these particular drugs, these diuretics, may be beneficial in patients who are volume overloaded. So it may be indicated in a patient who has some type of congestive heart failure, or they have volume overload, which is iatrogenic. So maybe they've been in the hospital for like, you know, a couple days, and they've gotten like crushed with 20 liters of fluid. In that situation, these may be particular drugs that we could give to pull some of the sodium, pull some of the water out of the actual blood, and then reducing blood volume, reducing preload, cardiac output, and lowering blood pressure. Again, we'll go over some more indications later, but I just want you to get the basic concept of why that could potentially be beneficial. Now, the basic mechanism of action we're gonna cover, we're not gonna go into detail because we'll cover that in the diuretics lecture. But the basic concept here is that when you give a diuretic, there's three particular diuretics. One category here, we're gonna put this one here first. One category is called your thiazide diuretics. So here's one category first. First one is your thiazides. Now thiazides, there's a couple different drugs and we'll talk about them, but what, here's the basic concept. When you filter fluid across your glomerulus, it should move down through this part, the descending limb of loop of Henle, then up the ascending limb of loop of Henle, and then it gets what's called the distal convoluted tubule, so right here. When fluid is passing through the distal convoluted tubule, there's particular channels here that reabsorb sodium and reabsorb chloride. So they work to potentially pull sodium and then subsequently, it'll pull water into the bloodstream. When I give thiazides, what thiazides are going to do is they're going to inhibit these channels. And now, me being able to bring sodium into the bloodstream is reduced, and then subsequently, the pull of water is reduced, and then what happens? 
I pee out tons of sodium chloride and water. And that's the whole concept here is that I'm reducing the sodium and water which will subsequently reduce the blood volume, the preload, the stroke volume, the cardiac output and the blood pressure. What are these drugs? These are hydrochlorothiazide, uh, there's also chlorothiazide, there's chlorthalidone, chlorthalidone, and another one that's a really interesting one is called metolazone. So these are the drugs that we could consider, thiazides. Now they're really good at hypertension and believe it or not, they happen to be one of the first line agents for hypertension and that's a really cool concept here. They're actually really, really good in uncomplicated essential hypertension and any kind of category where the patient be uh, not, you know, generally younger um, and have really no other particular problems is a pretty good drug. If they have CHF, it actually can provide an extra benefit as well. All right, another drug category is another interesting one. It works here. So we have the distal convoluted tubule via the thiazides. The other one over here, the second category of drug, is another one that we can utilize, and this is called a loop diuretics. So these are your loop diuretics. Now the loop diuretics, there's a couple of these, but what they do is, here at the ascending limb, so here's the fluid, it's running through the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, generally there's a sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter that pulls massive amounts of sodium and pull massive amounts of water across the kidney tubules and into the bloodstream. Well, if I give a loop diuretic, what it's going to do is it's going to inhibit the sodium chloride, uh, sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter, and I inhibit the sodium and water reabsorption. I drop the blood volume, the preload, the stroke volume, cardiac output, and the blood pressure. What kind of drugs are there here? These could be furosemide. Furosemide. This would be bumetanide. This would be torsamide. These are very, very commonly utilized drugs, particularly in patients who have CHF. Now, thiazides are really good for essential hypertension. So it is important to remember, this is gonna be out of all the diuretics, the one that we would likely use for hypertension is going to be this one. This is likely gonna be your first line agent out of all of the diuretics. You really won't go to loops. The loops are mainly gonna be patients who are like completely and fulminantly volume overloaded and have CHF and you're giving it more for the symptom control. You're trying to treat their hypertension but they're so volume overloaded, you pull that volume off, you'll pull their blood pressure down. That's really the true only indication for loops. Now, these drugs have similar side effect profiles. Again, we'll go over them in the actual diuretics lecture, but for right now, since they pull lots of sodium, since they pull chloride into the actual urine, what would you see as a potential adverse effect from both of these? You can see hyponatremia. You can also see that when you pull sodium, you also pull potassium and protons. And so from these drugs, you can also see hypokalemia and you pull protons, so you can also see metabolic alkalosis as another potential uh, adverse effect. So you can also see metabolic alkalosis. The other thing here, which I'll talk about briefly, is that they both inhibit uric acid excretion of the proximal convoluted tubule. And so because of that, they can really bump up your uric acid levels. And so you want to watch out for this. Don't give this to people who got a big old hot, big toe from gout, okay? Because this can really bump up your uric acid levels. Loop diuretics also may jack up the ear too, so watch out for ototoxicity. But again, we'll go over all of these in more detail in the diuretic lecture. All right, the last category here of diuretics is the third one here. And this one's an interesting one. So this is called aldosterone antagonist. So you're probably like, wait, aldosterone? I thought, Zach, we were going to talk about uh, aldosterone and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, system inhibitors. We will, but this one also acts as a diuretic. So let's talk about it. So this one is your aldosterone antagonist. Now this one does have diuretic capabilities, but it's really important to remember that it is extremely mild, so it's not a super great diuretic. But what they're going to do is, at the same point of the distal convoluted tubule, there's also receptors, okay? There's receptors that from uh, aldosterone. So aldosterone has the ability to act on intracellular receptors that are present in these distal convoluted tubular cells. Let's actually just draw it right here. Here, we're gonna say that this is a distal convoluted tubule cell, right? Here is these channels here, sodium chloride channels. Aldosterone antagonists will actually work. Here's aldosterone. It'll bind onto a receptor and that'll actually activate particular enzymes that'll synthesize these particular channels that pull what? Sodium and pull water 
into the bloodstream. If I give a drug like an aldosterone antagonist, what it'll do is it'll inhibit aldosterone from being able to bind onto the receptor, inhibit the synthesis of these transporters, and inhibit sodium and water reabsorption, dropping blood volume, dropping cardiac output, dropping blood pressure. Now, these drugs are going to be things like eplernone, and this is also going to be things like amylaride, and another one called spironolactone. And these drugs, again, not super powerful hypertensive agents, but they can be utilized to reduce mortality in patients with CHF. One of the big things to watch out for with these drugs, and we'll probably recap it a little bit later, is that because they inhibit aldosterone, aldosterone not only reabsorbs sodium and water, it excretes potassium. So you inhibited the excretion of potassium, so potassium can actually go up. It's the only one that actually spares potassium. So watch out for hyper kalemia with this particular drug. And then with spironolactone, eh, it can actually cause the blockage of multiple other androgens, so sex hormones. And so this may lead to the effect of gynecomastia. So watch out for gynecomastia with spironolactone. All right, my friends, that covers the diuretics. So we've covered the sympatholytics. We've covered the diuretics. Now let's move on to the next category, which is the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone synthesis inhibitors. All right, so renin, angiotensin, aldosterone synthesis inhibitors. Man, it's a mouthful. With these particular drugs, how do they work to treat hypertension? Well, we gotta briefly go through the pathway. All right, kidneys. They make a very special molecule called renin. Now your question that should be popping out there is, well, what actually triggers renin production, Zach? Ah, oh, great question. So on the actual uh, kidney, there is special receptors called beta-1 receptors, right? So there is beta-1 receptors that are present on these cells in the kidney called the juxtaglomerular cells. And when stimulated, stimulated by what? The sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system can release what type of molecule here? Noroepinephrine. That'll act on these beta-1 receptors and start pumping out renin. That's one particular mechanism. The second mechanism that actually causes renin production here is that whenever a patient has low renal perfusion, so if there is very poor perfusion to the kidneys, so a decreased perfusion, so a decreased perfusion, maybe this is due to a decreased cardiac output. So there's a reduced perfusion to the kidneys. This can also stimulate the juxtaglomerular cells to pump out renin. But either way, renin's being made. When renin is made, and it's made in a lot, it interacts with a very special molecule made by the liver. What is this molecule called? This is called angiotensinogen. Now, angiotensinogen is made by the liver. What happens is renin, when it's made, it acts on angiotensinogen. And what it does is it actually takes angiotensinogen and converts it. It stimulates this. It's renin's an enzyme. And it stimulates angiotensinogen by cleaving off a couple amino acids and turns it into something called angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensin 1 then goes to the lungs. In the capillary endothelium of the lungs, there is this special cool enzyme. What is this enzyme? This enzyme is called angiotensin converting enzyme. This enzyme is a very powerful enzyme. And what it does is it takes angiotensin 1, cleaves off a couple more amino acids, and then synthesizes something called angiotensin 2. So let's actually do it like this. Let's actually say here's angiotensin 1, it'll run through here, and it'll pop out here after it interacts with this enzyme into angiotensin 2, which is in the lungs. Now, what happens here? Angiotensin 2 then goes and acts on various different tissues various different tissues. One is it can go over and act on the heart tissue. It can also come here and act on the adrenal cortex. It can also come here and act on the central nervous system. It can also come down here, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, I'm just going to draw a couple dotted lines, but it has the ability to come down here and work on special parts of the kidney tubules as well and exert many different effects that can work to increase the patient's blood pressure. Let's talk about that. All right, so now angiotensin II is made, right? It's synthesized, okay? Once angiotensin II is made, it then goes and it works on blood vessels. And it's really powerful, very, very powerful. So here is the artery, right? Here's an artery of our uh, coronary, of our uh, vascular systemic circulation, and here's the vein. 
Now normally, again, the artery, if we take a piece of a cell here and actually zoom in on it, we're gonna see this. Piece of a cell here, we're gonna zoom in on it. So here's an arterial smooth muscle cell, and here's a venous smooth muscle cell. On these, they have a very special type of receptor. This is called an angiotensin II receptor. So this is an angiotensin II receptor. When angiotensin II binds onto this particular receptor, it produces a very profound load of ions, positive ions into these actual smooth muscle cells, which causes an intense contraction. And when it causes this intense contraction of the actual smooth muscle cells, it does what? Well, naturally, it'll cause the vein to squeeze like a son of a gun. So here, we're gonna have two pathways here. This is gonna be the normal pathway by angiotensin. So for the arterial pathway, this is the normal pathway when angiotensin II is high. It'll actually cause vasoconstriction. So if it causes vasoconstriction, it'll really cause the blood vessel, the actual blood vessel diameter to decrease. And that really pumps up your systemic vascular resistance. And that really pumps up your blood pressure. So your blood pressure goes up intensely. On top of that, it also works on the venous smooth muscle cells. And when it works on them, it actually causes venoconstriction. And if you venoconstrict these puppies, you're gonna really push a lot of blood, where? Into the right heart. And so it increases your preload. And if you increase preload, you increase stroke volume, cardiac output, and subsequently you increase blood pressure. So that's one way that angiotensin II can directly increase our blood pressure is by squeezing the heck out of the arteries and squeezing the heck out of the veins. Increasing resistance, increasing preload, and subsequently increasing blood pressure. Okay, another thing angiotensin II can do is it can act on the adrenal cortex and the adrenal cortex will then start pumping out a very special type of molecule. This molecule is called aldosterone. You're probably wondering where did that aldosterone come from before? When aldosterone is actually synthesized, it's synthesized because angiotensin II is stimulating the adrenal cortex to pump it out. So now it's gonna be stimulated here. Aldosterone will then work its way down to the actual kidney tubules. And when it gets into the kidney tubules, what it does is, Remember I told you it acts on special receptors that increase sodium and chloride transporters on the tubular lumen. And because of that, you can pull more sodium and water into the bloodstream. So the effect here is that you're going to yank more sodium and more water into the bloodstream. So the effective process here is it'll increase sodium, it'll increase water, and that will do what? That'll increase your blood volume. And we know that if we increase blood volume, we increase preload, we increase stroke volume, cardiac output, blood pressure, yada, yada. That's one effect, okay? It also, we'll talk about this little effect here later that we're gonna, actually, well, let's just do it now. Let's just do it now. Here, I'll dot, angiotensin II can also come over here. Now, it, it does work here, again, to stimulate the zona glomerulosa to make aldosterone, increase sodium water reabsorption, increase blood volume. But it also can act over here on the arterial system. So you know blood going into the glomerulus? This is your afferent arterial, so this artery here. And then leaving the glomerulus, this part here, is your efferent arterial. There's lots and lots of angiotensin II receptors that are present on the efferent arterial. And you're probably wondering like, why? All right, you know, all right well, I, I got you. So here on the efferent arterial, there's a lot of angiotensin II receptors. When angiotensin II binds on to these receptors on the efferent arterial, it squeezes the heck out of them. If you squeeze, so imagine here, I'm going to squeeze on this efferent arterial, what do you think is gonna happen? If I have angiotensin II here, and I squeeze, I bind on to these efferent arterial receptors, I squeeze them, I vasoconstrict it, what's gonna happen to the pressure? So imagine you have like, I'm squeezing here and blood is supposed to be leaving the glomerulus and going into the efferent arterials. Now it's being occluded. The pressure in the glomerulus is going to shoot up. Because of that, if I stimulate this thing, if I vasoconstrict it, guess what's gonna happen? I'm gonna increase the glomerular blood pressure. If I increase the glomerular blood pressure, I'm going to subsequently increase the glomerular filtration rate. I'm going to increase protein to be lost, protein loss, and I'm going to thicken the glomerular basement membrane. These are the three problematic issues with this. Because if the pressure in the glomerulus is super, super high, it's gonna cause you to now push tons of fluid, 
which is going to have be fluid and proteins into the actual convoluted tubular system. So that's going to cause a massive GFR, massive protein loss. But it's also going to put a lot of injury on the glomerular base membrane from high pressure, and it can thicken it and progress patients to chronic kidney disease. Whew, man, that's a son of a gun, this angiotensin too. Okay, so one thing is it squeezes arteries, veins. It then increases aldosterone, which increases sodium water reabsorption. It causes efferent arterial vasoconstriction, which increases intraglomerular blood pressure, increases GFR, increases protein loss, and thickens the glomerular basement membrane. What else can this son of a gun do? Don't worry, there's more. It also tells the posterior pituitary to pump out what's called antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone will then work its way down to the actual kidney tubules at the collecting duct. So here's the collecting duct. This one worked here at aldosterone at the distal convoluted tubule. But what ADH does is it actually works on aquaporins. It increases the expression of aquaporins, which pulls and yanks water into the bloodstream. So it increases water reabsorption. And if you increase water reabsorption, you increase blood volume. Now again, we're seeing an effect of an increase in blood volume. So with the combination of aldosterone and ADH, what you're seeing here is with ADH and with aldosterone, is you're seeing a really interesting combo here. You're seeing that they're working on the kidneys to retain sodium and water. And so because of that, they're going to do what? They're going to pull more sodium and water into the bloodstream. It's going to increase sodium water reabsorption. That'll increase blood volume. That'll increase preload. That'll increase stroke volume and cardiac output, and that'll increase the patient's blood pressure. You're like, Zach, okay, I thought that we were supposed to talk about antihypertensives in this dang lecture. We are, but now we know exactly how these antihypertensives are gonna work now for this system. Let's come up, let's talk about the drug categories because there's three of them that I wanna go through. First one is gonna be starting here at the ACE, then we'll come down here and talk about the angiotensin II receptors, and then we'll finish off with aldosterone antagonists, briefly recapping because we already talked about it. All right, so the first category of drugs. Now there is one drug up here that you technically do have a drug that it can inhibit renin. Uh, it's called alaskyrin, but it's just not utilized. We don't utilize it. You, theoretically, it seems like an amazing drug, but we just don't use it. So alaskyrin is one of those drugs, but I'm not even gonna write it down because again, it's not a drug that you're really ever gonna see or prescribe. A drug that you will see and will prescribe is ACE inhibitors, okay? So these are very commonly utilized drugs. So ACE inhibitors is gonna be one of these types of drugs in the renin angiotensin aldosterone blockers. So what is this drug category here? This is going to be your ACE inhibitors, your angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. These are really, really good drugs. I really like these drugs. And one of, it sounds a little weird when I say I really like drugs, but this drug here is, you're gonna remember the prills. All right, so this is like lisinopril. This is a really commonly utilized one. I actually, common, I, I prefer captopril as well. This is a really good one. Um, there's also um, another one called benzapril. Um, and then there is also enalapril. There's a lot of these men out there. So there's a lot of different, just remember the prills, okay? Now, with these particular drugs, you're wondering how do they actually help with hypertension, right? Okay, well what they do is, these drugs, these ACE inhibitors, they're inhibiting the ACE enzyme. If they inhibit the ACE enzyme, they inhibit angiotensin one being converted into angiotensin two. So they subsequently drop the angiotensin two levels. If I drop the angiotensin II levels, my friends, tell me, tell me please, what is the overall effect of this? The overall effect of reducing angiotensin II is that I'm going to reduce arterial vasoconstriction. I'm going to reduce venoconstriction. I'm going to reduce aldosterone Oh my gosh, there's so many things. I'm going to reduce ADH production. I'm going to reduce the glomerular blood pressure. All of these things are gonna be helpful. So I'm going to reduce the patient's arterial vasoconstriction. That's gonna reduce the resistance, reduce their blood pressure. I'm gonna reduce venoconstriction. That's gonna reduce preload, reduce stroke volume, critic output blood pressure. I'm gonna reduce aldosterone, reduce sodium water. Uh, ADH, reduce water reabsorption, reduce blood volume, preload, <laughs> stroke volume, cardiac output, and I'm gonna reduce the glomerular blood pressure, preventing GBM thickening, preventing protein urea, preventing an increase in GFR. Now, that may be interesting, right? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Why would you wanna drop the GFR? That's one of the potential downsides that you can actually see or an adverse effect of these drugs. We'll get to it a little bit later. 
One big thing with these drugs, okay, is ACEs not only convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Let's see, let's do this in this beautiful color here. Okay, there's a molecule called bradykinins. Bradykinins. Now, bradykinins are these very interesting, like little molecules, kind of like little inflammatory mediators, if you will. And they're supposed to be acted on by the angiotensin converting enzyme into like these different inactive metabolites that don't have that type of inflammatory nature to them. If I give an ACE inhibitor, I inhibit the conversion of bradykinin to the inactive metabolites. And so what happens to the bradykinin levels? They go up. If bradykinin levels go up, the problem with this is two potential things. One is that elevated levels of bradykinin can actually cause agitation of cough receptors. And so this will cause patients to have a nasty little cough. It also can cause an increase in inflammation. So it can cause a little bit of vasodilation of the uh, pulmonary blood vessels or the bronchial blood vessels and cause capillary leakage. So it may cause inflammation, uh, particularly of some of the upper respiratory tree and low respiratory tree. So this may cause angioedema. So watch out for these things, which you're gonna see way more commonly with ACE inhibitors than you will with the other drugs within this category. So there's a lot higher risk of dry cough and angioedema due to altering, uh, uh, altering the bradykinin pathway. All right, beautiful. Okay, the next drug category is the aldosterone, and I'm sorry, the uh, angiotensin II blockers, or the angiotensin II receptor blockers. So let's talk about this drug category here. So the second drug category that I want to mention here, the second drug category, and I often find the, I am very fond of these ones as well, is your angiotensin II receptor blockers, your ARBS, your ARBS. These drugs, there's a lot of these, Lazartan, Valzartan, Candazartan, lots of these particular medications. But the basic concept here is that these drugs, angiotensin II receptor blockers, will bind onto all of the receptors that angiotensin II binds onto. So everywhere that angiotensin II receptors are gonna bind, every, everywhere angiotensin II binds onto a particular receptor, it's going to inhibit it. So what would that do? Let's come down and take a look at what that would do. So what would it do? Think about it. Angiotensin II binds onto the angiotensin II receptors on the venous smooth muscle and the arterial smooth muscle. Smooth, smooth muscle. <laughs> so it's going to inhibit it on these two particular sites. So what's that going to look like? It's going to inhibit venal constriction and it's going to inhibit arteriolar vasoconstriction. So it's going to, again, inhibit angiotensin, angiotensin II blocking. And so that will, again, reduce arterial, arterial vasoconstriction. That'll reduce systemic vascular resistance. It'll reduce venoconstriction. That'll reduce preload. That'll reduce your cardiac output, your blood pressure. What else? It also will inhibit the aldosterone release, so it'll block these particular receptors, and it'll block ADH from being able to be released. So it'll reduce ADH. It'll reduce aldosterone. What's the overall effect of these two particular things? If you inhibit aldosterone, you inhibit sodium and water reabsorption. If you inhibit ADH, you inhibit water reabsorption. This inhibits the increase in blood volume. This inhibits the increase in preload, stroke volume, cardiac output. And what else? You also inhibit angiotensin II from being able to bind onto the angiotensin II receptors on the efferent arterial. That's going to lower the glomerular blood pressure. That'll then reduce the GFR, reduce the protein loss, and reduce the thickening of the glomerular basement membrane. Man, we could. Now, angiotensin II receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors are very commonly utilized drugs, okay? The reason that you also wanna think about these drugs is really because, because they have the ability to inhibit aldosterone, right, they reduce aldosterone production. What is a potential adverse effect that you may see from both the uh, angiotensin receptor blockers and the ACE inhibitors? So because it inhibits aldosterone, you actually can see hyperkalemia. So watch out for hyperkalemia. Because it reduces the glomerular blood pressure, it's gonna reduce the GFR. So if it reduces the GFR, it can actually do what to the creatinine? It can decrease your creatinine clearance. And so the creatinine can actually increase. So watch for that as well. 
And the other thing is these are teratogenic, so don't give this to a pregnant woman as well. So these are some of the things that you want to be able to consider with these particular drugs. So angiotensin receptor blockers, they may bump the potassium, they may increase the creatinine uh, by dropping the GFR. But again, I think the other thing is that you get more of a cough, a dry cough from the bradykinins and angioedema, more particularly from the ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors can also cause hyperkalemia and dro drop your GFR and again, increase your creatinine. So you can see both of these effects in both of these particular drug categories. Okay, but you see more of the angioedema and more of the dry cough in the ACE inhibitors. Okay, the last category, my friends, is the, uh, the aldosterone antagonist. And thankfully, we've already covered these, but just to recap them, again, aldosterone antagonist is the third category within this drug situation here. And this is, again, your eplernone. This is your uh, spironolactone. And this is your amyloride. And again, remember with these that you're inhibiting aldosterone. So because you're inhibiting aldosterone, you have the ability to cause hyperkalemia. So watch out for hyperkalemia. And again, because spironolactone um, blocks the androgens, so a lot of steroid hormones that are involved within a lot of you know, sex drive and a lot of other things, this can potentially lead to one adverse effect that you see called gynecomastia, more particularly with this drug. But that is the concept of these ACE inhibitors and these ARBs, is that they're really, really good at being able to treat blood pressure and really reducing your blood pressure through all of these mechanisms that we went through. Whereas the aldosterone antagonists, they're really only gonna be doing what? They're really only gonna be reducing sodium and water retention. So that may be a benefit, if, it, if potentially more for the diuretic type of function, but you'll see later that this is a drug that has been shown to be potentially beneficial and reduce mortality. So it may be a drug that we give to patients who have CHF um, because it actually can provide some augmentation of diuresis, but it also reduces mortality associated with that disease. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But that is the whole concept of these drugs. Now that we finish these off, we have one more category. That's our vasodilators. Let's hop over there. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the last class of drugs, which are our vasodilators, okay? Now, vasodilating is very interesting, right? So let's talk about how vasodilation occurs, really, and what's the overall effect if it was in an artery versus if it was like in a systemic vein. So if I were to do this, let's just do the arterial portion first here in red. So if an artery, right, is working to control blood pressure, if I have an artery, right, and it undergoes vasoconstriction, right, so it squeezes, right, so it squeezes, and when it squeezes, it undergoes vasoconstriction, what will happen is that will cause an increase in systemic vascular resistance and subsequently an increase in your blood pressure. We know that, okay? The next thing is in the vein, the vein's also really important, right? So when the veins are potentially working and actually being acted on through specific vaso you know, mechanisms, vasotone mechanisms, when the veins constrict, so you have what's called venoconstriction, so we're gonna call this venoconstriction, when they constrict, what they do is, they help to actually increase preload. So they squeeze more blood up into the right heart. Whereas if I squeeze these arteries, I'm making it difficult, more resistance to blood flow as it flows through the arterial circuit, right? So because of that, if I increase preload, I increase the amount of blood going back to the heart, I increase my stroke volume, my cardiac output, and subsequently I increase my blood pressure. So when I give drugs, there's two categories of drugs. One is called venodilators, right? So I wanna talk about the drugs that are actually what's called venodilators. And these venodilators, what will they potentially do? These venodilators will actually inhibit venoconstriction, reduce preload, reduce stroke volume, reduce cardiac output, and reduce blood pressure. That's how they'll treat that process. And then you have another category of drugs here, which are called your arterial dilators. And these will work by doing what? Inhibiting the vasoconstriction of the arteries, which will drop the systemic vascular resistance and drop the blood pressure. Okay, the first category that I want to discuss is the arterial dilators is a really interesting one. I'm actually gonna mention it up here. 
And what these, these particular category of drugs is, this is actually a drug category, which I happen to be very, very fond of. They are called dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. So dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, really, really good, powerful drugs. Now what these do is, is you obviously can tell via the name that they block calcium channels. There is calcium channels that are very mildly present on the venous smooth muscle, but way more powerful and way more present on the arterial smooth muscle. So these are gonna be more, particularly arterial vasodilators. Now, what happens is calcium is present on these smooth muscle cells. When these calcium channels are open, calcium floods in, and calcium will actually interact and be utilized within the uh, myofilaments, right, to be able to allow for contraction. So we know that, it, you know, how calcium binds onto the, you know, it binds onto the different proteins like the troponin, changes the shape of the tropomyosin, allows for actinomyosin to bind, and boom, you get the sliding filament theory. If I have a drug, like a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, what they'll do is, is they will block the calcium from being able to enter. If calcium isn't able to enter, is it gonna be utilized by the myofilaments to induce contraction? No, so it will inhibit this process and the smooth muscle will relax. If it relaxes, it no longer vasoconstricts, it vasodilates. If it vasodilates, so then this is going to undergo vasodilation. And if it vasodilates, it reduces the systemic vascular resistance. If you reduce the systemic vascular resistance, you're going to drop the blood pressure. What are the drugs that we utilize in this category here? There is one particular drug here which I um, commonly utilize is called amlodipine. Amlodipine is a very commonly utilized one. Another one is called nifedipine. It's nifedipine. Another one is called um, nicardipine. Nicardipine. Another one is called nimodipine. This is a very commonly utilized one in our subarachnoid patients. Um, and then another one is called clavidipine. So with these drugs, these are some of the drugs that you can prescribe. The most commonly kind of like prescribed outpatient ones are going to be amlodipine and nifedipine. And the most commonly utilized ones generally in the ICU or hospital kind of setting or as infusions is clavidipine and nicardipine. Very, very good, powerful drugs. Now, generally with these drugs, right, what I really want you to understand is with any arterial vasodilator, what is the potential adverse effect that you can see with these drugs? Great question. With an arterial dilator, what you do is you reduce systemic vascular resistance, you reduce blood pressure. What does that do to, again, your central nervous system? It tells the baroreceptors, hey, hey, blood pressure is low. So it stimulates the baroreceptors. And the baroreceptors, once stimulated, activates what? Your central nervous system. Your central nervous system will then stimulate an increase in heart rate as a reflex tachycardia. So watch for reflex tachycardia with arterial vasodilation. We saw that with the alpha-1 blockers that they can get reflex tachycardia. That's a very common uh, adverse effect with these types of dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers or really any arterial vasodilator. Because they have very minimal venodilation effects, they may cause orthostatic hypotension. So there is very small, and I mean this very importantly, it's is a very mild amount of calcium channels that are present on veins, very, very little. So because of that, you could potentially see some venodilation effect, but it's very, very mild. And I would focus more particularly on the arterial vasodilation. Now, here's the thing that I want you, you guys should be asking the question. You said dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like it's something special, Zach. I, I, don't, I don't understand why you mentioned that. The calcium channels that are present on the arterial smooth muscle and even on the venous smooth muscle are only dihydropyridine. They're only dihydropyridine. The other types of calcium channels that are present in other areas like the cardiac myocytes are non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. And they deserve a discussion here too. We shouldn't just let them out of the discussion as well. So let's talk about those drugs. So this drug is gonna be the second category of drugs here, and these are called your non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. I'm gonna kind of abbreviate, nah, just we'll write it. So non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. And these are only present, so these are the only ones that are present on the myocardial cells. You do not have dihydropyridine um, calcium channels that are present on the myocardial cells. 
Very, very important to remember that. So these types of structures here, the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, there's two particular agents here. One is called verapamil, verapamil, and the other one is called diltiazem, diltiazem. Now, what's really important with these drugs is that they work on the calcium channels that are on the contractile myocardium and on the nodal cells, so on the AV node, SA node, all those structures. And so because of that, these have calcium channels that allow for calcium to flood into them, right? So calcium is supposed to move into the contractile cell, stimulate the you know, contraction of the contractile cell. It's also supposed to run into the nodal cell, stimulate this cell to generate action potentials and increase conduction through the heart. But when I give a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, what I'm doing is I'm inhibiting these calcium channels. I'm inhibiting calcium entry into the contractile cell and into the nodal cell. And therefore, I will decrease contractility. If I decrease contractility of the heart, I'm going to decrease the cardiac output and I'm going to subsequently decrease the patient's blood pressure. The nodal cell, I'm going to reduce the heart rate and therefore I'm going to reduce the cardiac output and I'm going to reduce the blood pressure. So these drugs can be utilized in hypertension. Here's the other thing. It's important to remember, because these drugs do primarily work on the heart, some of the adverse effects that you have to watch out for, there's two that are super obvious here. One is it can drop the heart rate. And so because of that, you wanna watch out for any types of bradycardia, because this can actually drop the patient's heart rate. The other thing is it can reduce his contractility. If a patient already has a poor cardiac output, such as in decompensated heart failure, you could potentially kill them and make them hypotensive, put them into cardiogenic shock. So it can really, really drop the blood pressure and then put the patient into shock, especially if they have decompensated heart failure. So avoid in that particular situation. One thing that you wanna remember is that the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, they do have a very mild, a very mild vasodilatory effect. So these do have a small capacity to bind onto the dihydropyridine calcium channels and inhibit them. So because of that, I want you to remember that, and we're gonna put this like, I don't know, let's do it in this beautiful blue color here, is that they have an important kind of a mention here, is that they have a very small um, vasodilation effect. Okay, and if you're really comparing between these, verapamil has more of a potent effect, and diltiazem is a very mild vasodilatory effect. So they do have a very small vasodilation effect, so therefore they can actually do what? Reduce systemic vascular resistance and also reduce blood pressure. So you may be able to see a small reduction in systemic vascular resistance and subsequently a reduction in blood pressure, but it's very, very mild. Whereas these drugs, the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, they have no effect on the cardiac myocytes. So they have no effect on the cardiac myocytes. So they will not be util, they won't be able to reduce heart rate and reduce contractility. But the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, they have the ability to reduce heart rate, contractility, and very mild vasodilatory effect. So they will be able to mildly reduce systemic vascular resistance. If you had to compare which one's better, verapamil has more of a vasodilatory effect than diltiazem. Okay, that's the big things that I want you to remember for these drugs. Okay. We talked about the calcium channel blockers. Very, very good agents, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Happen to be first line, one of my preferred. But now, let's come down and talk about some other ones. With these things, we've talked about calcium channels, right? How there's very, very, there's more calcium channels, way more calcium channels present on the arterial smooth muscle, and very little calcium channels that are present on the venous smooth muscle. So calcium still can come in, and then again, interact with the smooth muscle in these venous cells. So if you give a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker or a non-dihydropyridine, they have a very mild inhibitory effect, so they may cause venodilation. And what we know about venodilation is that venodilation does what? If you venodilate, you reduce preload, that reduces stroke volume, cardiac output, and that reduces blood pressure. Now, that's the basic concept here, okay? So the other thing is there's, there's one more arterial, uh, actually two more arterial dilators that I wanna talk about. They're really, really cool to be honest with you. So here we have, let's say, this special enzyme here on the cell membrane. This enzyme is called guanylyl cyclase. 
And what guanyl alcyclase does is it takes a molecule called GTP, converts it into what's called cyclic GMP. And then cyclic GMP act on, acts on an enzyme called protein kinase G. And what this does is this actually inhibits muscle contraction, okay? So generally, this pathway would work to inhibit muscle contraction. So if I had some way, shape or form, I could give particular drugs that could activate the guanyl acyclase, that might be able to increase the cyclic GMP, increase protein kinase G, and inhibit the smooth muscle cells. Guess what? There is particular drugs that can do that. All right, I can give one particular drug category here. One, I wanna put here, and we'll talk about it in just a second, can stimulate guanyl acyclase directly. And another one does it through another interesting way. Another drug category can actually do something else where they can increase nitric oxide. And when you increase nitric oxide, what this does is this also stimulates guanyl acyclase. If it stimulates guanyl acyclase, that stimulates this process to increase cyclic GMP, that increases the phosphorylation of protein kinase G, and that increases the inhibition of the smooth muscles, and that will actually cause arterial vasodilation, reduce the resistance, and reduce the blood pressure. What are the drugs that actually work to directly stimulate guanyl acyclase or increase nitric oxide to activate guanyl acyclase? Let's come down and talk about those. So that leads us to the third category here. So the third category of drug that I wanna talk about, really interesting type of process here, is these drugs are the ones that are going to increase cyclic GMP via stimulating guanyl acyclase directly, okay? So these are actually referred to as what's called direct acting vasodilators. So if you really wanna put that down here, you can actually call these direct acting vasodilators. One particular drug within this is called hydralazine, okay? Hydralazine. And so hydralazine will work to actually cause, again, stimulation of guanyl acyclase directly, increase cyclic GMP, increase protein kinase G, and then inhibit the arterial smooth muscle and cause it to relax. That'll cause arterial vasodilation, that'll cause decrease in resistance and decrease in blood pressure. Now hydralazine. With this particular drug here, again, we already know that the adverse effect out of this one is already what we've discussed. It is gonna cause a compensatory reflex tachycardia. We should already know that mechanism and have it understood, is that it reduces resistance, drop blood pressure, and creates a compensatory stimulation of baroreceptors to increase heart rate. The other thing which is a little odd with this one is that, I, I, honestly, it's not completely understood. It may cause like an autoantibody production, but it actually can cause a drug-induced lupus. So watch out for what's called drug-induced um, SLE. Here's the one more thing. Hydralazine does prefer, so it does have more of a profound um, stimulates it's more profound to be able to work and inhibit arteries. So when, it, when we actually compare this, it actually will inhibit arteries and cause them to vasodilate way more than it'll actually inhibit veins. But nonetheless, it does have the ability to inhibit veins very minimally. So if you inhibit veins, what we'll talk about in a little bit here is another adverse effect from actually inhibiting veins is you reduce preload. If you reduce preload, you reduce the return of blood to the heart. That reduces the stroke volume, cardiac output, and blood pressure. If a patient goes from a supine to seated or a seated to standing, you try in a fluid shift. Generally, those patients would have an increase in venous return. If you venodilate them, they lose their venous tone. They don't have a good venous return. And so because of that, a potential adverse drug reaction from this is it may cause ortho, stasis. Another thing about this drug is it happens to be safe in pregnancy, which is also pretty cool, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so that's hydralazine. The next one is, and there's another drug in this category called minoxidil, but we don't really commonly utilize that anymore unless you're using some hair like me, so you can use that as like Rogaine. But the next one here is, uh, we're going to put this in the fourth category here. So the fourth category. So these are the ones that actually work to increase nitric oxide. So they work, they work to increase nitric oxide, which helps to stimulate guanyl acyclase, which helps to increase cyclic GMP. These are called nitro dilators. Now, with these nitro dilators, there's actually um, a couple of them. The one that's primarily gonna dilate arteries is going to be what's called nitroprusside. So there's another drug here called nitroprusside. 
Now, nitroprusside is an interesting drug, okay? It does cause intense arteriolar vasodilation. One of the downsides to this drug, <laughs> I don't ever use it because of this, is it can give off a cyanide molecule. And this can actually lead to cyanide toxicity. So if you think about that, imagine why that would be problematic. So generally, uh, cyanide can actually be taken up by the mitochondria and it will inhibit the electron transport chain. So it's gonna inhibit the electron transport chain. Now the electron transport chain isn't gonna be able to take oxygen, utilize that, and then make ATP. This is inhibited now. And so because of that, what does your body shift into utilizing as an energy source? It starts you know, undergoing anaerobic glycolysis. And so because of that, what happens as a result of this cyanide toxicity is that the patients may develop what's called an increase in lactic acid. So they can have what's called lactic acidosis as a potential adverse effect. So you can see cyanide toxicity with high doses. You can see lactic acidosis with high doses. Secondary to the cyanide toxicity. There's one more thing. <laughs> cyanide is not the only problem here. It's also been shown that this drug, if you take the coronary vessels here, so here's gonna be the coronary vessels. Here's a coronary vessel and it's splitting and I'm gonna have one going here and I'm gonna have another coronary vessel kind of going this way, okay? Let's say here there's a plaque in this part of the vessel, okay? And there's no plaque in this part of the vessel. What nitroprusside will do is, it'll actually kind of like vasodilate the healthy coronary vessels a little bit too much. If I vasodilate this healthy coronary vessel in comparison to this plaqued up vessel, look at the difference now. So I'm gonna kind of dilate this one up. I'm gonna exaggerate it a little bit now. I'm gonna dilate this puppy. Now this vessel is under much lower pressure. This vessel's under much higher pressure. Where's the blood gonna wanna go? It's not gonna wanna go down this coronary vessel, that's for sure. It's gonna wanna all go down this coronary vessel. And so because of this, this is actually somewhat dangerous and can actually lead to the myocardial cells. So imagine here's a myocardial cell and then here's a myocardial cell. What's gonna to happen to this poor myocardial cell that's getting almost no blood flow? It can start to become ischemic and potentially die. This is called coronary steel syndrome. So you wanna watch out for this too as a potential complication called coronary steel syndrome. This is another potential adverse effect of this drug and why I'm not a huge fan of this drug. Okay, there is another one. I'm going to briefly discuss it here because it actually does two things. So I'm gonna end up mentioning it twice. So the next one here is called nitroglycerin. Now nitroglycerin, what I wanna do is I'm just gonna write one particular thing here. Nitroglycerin does have the ability again to do everything that nitroprusside does, right? So increase nitric oxide, activate guanylocyclase, increase cyclic GMP, cause vasodilation, okay? Particularly of the arteries. But in order for it to be able to cause arterial vasodilation, it has to be at extremely high doses. So it's important to remember that nitroglycerin actually prefers to inhibit veins, so to cause venodilation, way more so than it prefers to cause inhibition of the arteries. So arterial vasodilation. The only reason it would actually start to inhibit the arteries and actually cause arterial vasodilation, this is actually important, so I'm gonna write it here in this blue here, is that it only will actually do this particular process here when you're at extremely high doses of nitroglycerin. So at extremely high doses of nitroglycerin, then you will start to get more arterial vasodilation. And so that's why nitroglycerin technically can't be an arterial vasodilator, but it has to be at extremely high doses, like upwards of like 300, 400 mics um, of, of uh, nitroglycerin to be able to really get a vasodilatory effect of the arteries. Okay? So, so far with arterial vasodilators, we have covered the non-dihydropyridine, which is very mild for apomyl dotizum. They're mainly inhibiting heart rate, inhibiting cardiac contractility. We talked about dihydropyridine, very powerful vasodilators, amlodipine, nifedipine, nicardipine, nimodipine, clavidipine, we talked about those. Then we talked about the ones that directly act on the vessel to increase cyclic GMP, hydralazine, minoxidil, and then we talked about the ones that increase nitric oxide, which activate guanylocyclase and increase cyclic GMP. And all of these things help to relax the vessel. That would be nitroprusside. And at high doses, you can dilate the arteries with nitroglycerin. 
All right, so we talked about the arterial dilators, right? We talked about them pretty in depth. We talked about the non-dihydropyridine, the dihydropyridine, we talked about hydralazine, and we talked about nitroprusside, nitroglycerin. The venodilators, they're not really that many, and they're not really super powerful at treating hypertension, to be honest with you. But we're gonna briefly mention them for the sake of the you know completeness of the lecture. But when we talk about venodilators, one of the concepts here is that whenever you kind of work to dilate the veins, we've already kind of mentioned that Calcium channel blockers have a very mild effect on the veins and dilating them. But there is this same mechanism over here on the veins, much more powerful with respect to this. So because of that, there is this enzyme here called guanylyl cyclase. And again, guanylyl cyclase, when it's activated, can take and turn what's called GTP into cyclic GMP that can work to act on protein kinase G and protein kinase G will work to inhibit this particular smooth muscle from contracting. Now, if I give a drug that works to increase nitric oxide that will stimulate the guanylyl cyclase, increase the conversion of GTP into cyclic GMP, increase protein kinase G activation and inhibit the smooth muscle, smooth muscle cell from contracting. So because of that, really it's this kind of concept. Yes, hydralazine may be able to directly activate the guanylyl cyclase and the veins, but again, I want you to think about it more as an arterial vasodilator, very minimal venous dilation. The primary thing here is we're left with the nitrodilators, and we've already talked about nitroglycerin, how we said that's a primary venodilator. The other one that we're gonna talk about is called isosorbide dinitrate. Let's talk about those. So, for the venodilators, they're not super powerful antihypertensives, but we already talked about the nitrodilators for the arterial system, nitroprusside and then nitroglycerin at high doses. The venodilators, we'll put this as the fifth category, this is another nitrodilator. So it's the same concept here. They work to increase nitric oxide, they help to stimulate guanylyl cyclase, they help to increase cyclic GMP, and again, how, what kind of category are they in? These are nitrodilators. We talked about the nitrodilators in the arterial system, which is gonna be pretty much what? Nitroprusside and high dose nitroglycerin. For the venous dilation, this is low dose nitroglycerin, low dose nitroglycerin because at low doses, it prefers to venodilate than it does arterial dilate. So that's an important thing to remember here. Now, with any type of venodilation, we've already talked about this, but when you venodilate, you reduce preload, you reduce stroke volume, cardiac output, blood pressure, and especially if the patient goes from a seated to a standing, a supine to a seated, there's fluid shifts. You reduce their venous return. So one of the adverse effects out of this particular drug category with any venodilator is what? You may experience what type of effect here? Orthostasis. So this may be very common with these. But there's one more thing with nitroglycerin. Very important, especially for your exams. Because nitroglycerin really venodilates, you better be careful with a patient who has an RV that can't take a joke. If their right ventricles are just jacked up and it's not able to contract and it's not squeezing blood out of the right ventricle into the left heart, so now, if you have a patient who has what's called a right ventricular myocardial infarction, why is that a problem? This RV can't take a joke. So it already is gonna be reducing the amount of blood going from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. So there's a, left, a decrease in the left ventricular preload because it's not gonna be able to push as much blood to the left ventricle, right? Because it's jacked up. If that's the case, the left ventricular cardiac output is gonna drop, and then the left ventricular blood pressure is gonna drop, your systemic blood pressure is gonna drop, right? Now, give them nitroglycerin. What are you gonna do? If you give this patient nitroglycerin, guess what you're gonna do? On top of the RV already being all jacked up, you're going to decrease the right heart venous return. That's going to decrease the left ventricular preload even more. That's going to decrease their left ventricular cardiac output, decrease their left ventricular blood pressure, and you're gonna kill them because you're gonna put them into a hypotensive state. So in a patient who has a right ventricular MI that can't take a joke, you better be very careful because it can really, really drop this patient's blood pressure. So that's one thing, avoid nitros in patients who have, uh, who have a right ventricular MI. The other one is avoid this medication in a patient who has, what else? Who's taking a drug that acts similarly like a phosphodiesterase inhibitor or an alpha blocker. So avoid this in a patient who's taking what's called a phosphodiesterase 
5 inhibitor, so they're on that Viagra for the... And then another one is an alpha blocker, okay? So an alpha blocker would also do this. They can also block the veins. If you do that, you're reducing venous return extra. So for this one, you're going to significantly drop the preload. You're going to significantly drop the stroke volume, cardiac output, and you're going to drop the patient's blood pressure. So watch out because, again, hypotension may be an overt effect from combining nitro with a phosphodiesterase inhibitor or an alpha blocker. The last one here is a part of these venodilators, and this is called isosorbide dinitrate. Really, this drug is only commonly utilized, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is a very potent venodilator. So because it's a potent venodilator, it's really good in situations. The only true indication that we would utilize this for is in patients who have heart failure, who have heart failure, and are African American, and they're already taking, and they're on hydralazine. Hydralazine. And because this has uh, been studied, it's actually been shown to potentially be beneficial, maybe even reduce mortality mildly. In patients who are of African American descent, have heart failure and already on hydralazine, you may be able to add isosorbide dinitrate to reduce the preload, reduce the congestion in patients who have heart failure. All right, my goodness, we talked about all the vasodilators here. And again, I think the big thing to think about is if it's an arterial vasodilator, what's the most common adverse effect? Reflex tachycardia, or obviously hypotension. With venodilators, what's the most common adverse effect? Orthostatic hypotension because you're reducing preload. So don't forget that. All right, now let's go into particular antihypertensive medications and who we would prescribe this to, especially if they have an underlying comorbidity. All right, my friends, so we have covered every drug category that is an antihypertensive agent. We talked about sympatholytics, we talked about diuretics, we talked about patients who, I mean, we talked about renin angiotensin aldosterone synthesis inhibitors, and we talked about vasodilators. We went over all the different types of drugs. We went over particularly how they work. We went over some of the adverse effects. We covered some indications of some of them along the way. But what I really want you to understand is now that we know of all of these drugs, we know their names, they know how they work, which is like really important, and some of their adverse effects, we should really now be able to understand what type of situations I could actually give this hypertensive agent to a person who maybe has an underlying comorbidity. So generally there's an easy way. If I have a patient who has no problems, no diseases, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, that's the easy ones to tell them, oh, prescribe this one, prescribe this antihypertensive, prescribe this antihypertensive. It's more challenging to prescribe an antihypertensive when a patient has other comorbidities, such as the ones that we're going to list here. And what I want you to understand is not just to memorize. Don't just memorize, oh, you can give this drug and this and this drug and this. Da, 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 da. No, know why you give this drug in this particular situation so you can remember it, okay? And then after we go over giving hypertensive agents to people with underlying comorbidities, which one's best? And then we'll cover the easy one, which is patient doesn't really have any other underlying comorbidities. What are the best agents for them? What are the first line antihypertensives? And then what we'll do is we'll talk about a patient who comes in, they got a stroke, their heart's about to explode, they got a di an aortic dissection, they're peeing blood, and nothing but a hypertensive emergency because their BP is 1 over, 185 over 126. In those situations, what are the best agents to give? We'll talk about that in at a hypertensive emergency. But first things first, we have a patient here who has atrial fibrillation, they have atrial flutter, maybe they have like an, a supraventricular tachycardia that's chronic for them, and they have hypertension. Which one about all the agents would be best for these patients? And think about it. If a patient has atrial fibrillation, atrial um, flutter, SVT, in some way, shape, or form, their nodal cells are hyperactive and they're firing. And so in these particular patients, they're having increasing heart rates, right? which is gonna be doing what? Increasing their cardiac output, increasing their blood pressure potentially. Okay, well then you gotta go back and think. On the nodal cells, there were two types of things that I can modulate. One was a beta-1 receptor. So one of these was a beta-1 receptor. Actually, let's do it in red because it was red and looked cool. So this was a beta-1 receptor. And the other one was a non, I'm gonna kinda of put it, I'm gonna breathe this non, dihydropyridine calcium channel. Oh, okay. Well, if I give a drug like a beta blocker and I give a drug like a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, what I'll do is, is I'll inhibit 
this beta receptor from being stimulated, which will try to increase the heart rate. So I'll, I'll inhibit this process. And I'll reduce the heart rate, I'll reduce the cardiac output, and I'll reduce the blood pressure. And at the same time, these patients' hearts are beating really fast. I'll treat their AFib, their A flutter, and SVT, because the problem with these patients is they have fast heart rates. Well, if I give a drug like a beta blocker, that'll do that. If I give a drug like a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, I inhibit the calcium from entering into this nodal cell, then calcium will not come in. If calcium doesn't come in, if I inhibit this process, it's not going to be able to do what? Stimulate action potentials of the nodal cells down the AB node, or down the SA node, AB node, bundle of His, bundle branches, Purkinje system. Because of that, it will drop the patient's heart rate, drop their cardiac output, and drop their blood pressure. So because of that, these would be two great drugs in patients who have hypertension plus have some tachyarrhythmias. So what are these two particular drug categories? Oh, son of a gun. This would be, one would be a beta blocker, a beta one blocker. So this would be things like metoprolol, esmolol, atenolol, uh, bisoprolol, things of that nature. And then the second one would be what? A non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like verapamil, like diltiazem. That makes sense, right? So that's what I want you guys to be thinking about in this particular situation. All right, so patient has hypertension and they have a tachyarrhythmia, give them something that drops their heart rate. Pretty straight, straightforward. The next one is coronary artery disease and angina. So a patient has some type of disease process where their myocardium, right, here's our myocardial cells here. So here's the myocardial cells. So these are the myocardial cells. And this is a coronary blood vessel. And blood is supposed to be moving through this coronary blood vessel nice and easily and giving off oxygen to these myocardial cells so that they can use it to generate contractions, to generate action potentials, all of those things. We need it. The myocardial cells need it. But if they have a big old stinking plaque here that's really altering the decreased blood flow, so now there's decreased cerebral blood, I mean, so there's decreased coronary blood flow, and there's decreased exchange of oxygen across this big fat plaque into the myocardial cells, that's gonna reduce the oxygen delivery to the myocardial cells. If you reduce the oxygen delivery to the myocardial cells, that can lead to ischemia. Now, imagine that a patient also has another problem. So here's what happens in coronary artery disease. And one particular situation here, we reduce oxygen supply because of the plaque, right? Now here's the other problem. A patient who has like unstable angina or an instemi, it's not completely occluded. It can be partially occluded. But now here's where it gets really, really problematic. If the patient's myocardial cells need more oxygen because the patient's working harder for whatever reason, like they're hypertensive. If they're hypertensive, now their myocardium has to work harder to pump blood out of the heart. And so because of that, with that situation, what you can get is in a decreased oxygen supply, you can have the myocardium have an increase in O2 demand. And this is a recipe for disaster. When the myocardium is requiring more oxygen, you don't have enough oxygen to be able to give to it, what's the ultimate result here? Ischemia to the heart. And so the ultimate result here is this is going to lead to ischemia and if not treated, there's an increased risk of infarct to the myocardium. So I can't change the oxygen supply in these patients. That's where I'd have to go in and rip the, you know, stent open the vessel or cut the plaque out. I can't do that with drugs. But I can give a drug that reduces the O2 demand. In other words, the heart doesn't have to work as hard to pump blood out of it. Well, how do I do that? Well, let's, let's take a second here to look here. Well, one way, one way is if I work to inhibit those nodal cells. So one way is I can take the nodal cells. If I block the beta receptors and I block the calcium channels that allow for flow into them, right? So here I'm going to block these channels here. I'm going to block these calcium channels. Now calcium can't come in. Right, so there's not gonna be able to be calcium here. And then I'm also gonna block the beta-1 receptor, so now they can't stimulate the nodal cells. So what's the overall effect? If I inhibit the nodal cells, I can decrease heart rate. That will decrease cardiac output. That'll decrease the work of the heart. Right, so I'll decrease the demand. So effectively, what this will do is, this will decrease the demand of the heart. 
all right, that's pretty good. If I can reduce the demand, that may be helpful because then I'm not going to require as much oxygen. So I can give drugs that potentially can reduce the heart rate by inhibiting the non dihydropyridine calcium channels, right? So I got to inhibit these and I have to inhibit the beta-1 receptors. So that's already these drugs that I just talked about. They'll be able to do that. But you know what else is another benefit of them? If we look at the other cells, <laughs> look at the other cells here. Not just the nodal cells, but also the contractile cells. So here's my contractile cells. So this was a nodal. This way I'm just gonna put nodal cell. This is a nodal cell. Here is a contractile cell. And again, on this I have beta-1 receptors. And what else do I have on it? non dihydropyridine calcium channels. So if I give a drug that'll block calcium entry into this contractile cell, and I give a drug that'll block the beta-1 stimulation, that'll reduce what? Well, think about it. If I give drugs that inhibit the non dihydropyridine calcium channels, and I give a drug that blocks the beta-1 receptors, what am I gonna do? I'm going to decrease contractility. So if I decrease contractility, I'm going to decrease cardiac output, decrease work, and decrease demand. So all I got to do to really cause the heart to not beat as fast and to not contract as hard, which means it's not going to use as much oxygen, which means it's not going to have as high of a demand, that would help in coronary artery disease and angina. So any, uh, basically any patient who has unstable angina and STEM or maybe even stable angina where they're working really hard, this would be a particular drug that I could utilize. So what are these? One is a beta blocker. Two is a calcium channel blocker, okay? Particularly non dihydropyridine They're not super powerful, but they can be somewhat beneficial. The next one, <laughs> all right, this one's really cool. We have two mechanisms for this one. There's another drug which helps to be able to venodilate, okay? So this drug will actually work to venodilate. So it'll take this venous smooth muscle cell. So here's my venous smooth muscle cell. Here's my venous smooth muscle cell right here. So venous smooth muscle cell. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give this drug and this drug is going to increase nitric oxide inside here. So it's gonna increase nitric oxide. It's gonna activate what type of enzyme? Guanylal cyclase. That's gonna take GTP, convert it into cyclic GMP. And that's going to act on protein kinase G. And protein kinase G is going to inhibit muscle contraction. So your effect here is you're going to inhibit muscle contraction. This drug is a really powerful venodilator called nitroglycerin, called nitroglycerin. And what nitroglycerin will do is it'll increase nitric oxide, stimulate guanylocyclase, increase cyclic GMP, increase protein kinase G, and inhibit the actual venous smooth muscle cell from contracting. If that happens and I inhibit this smooth muscle cells in the veins from contracting, I reduce the preload to the right heart. If I reduce preload to the right heart, what do I do to the stroke volume, the cardiac output, the amount of work that the heart has to do to pump out more blood? So generally, if you have a lot of preload, if you have a lot of preload, that means that you're gonna have a higher stroke volume and your heart's gonna have to work harder to pump all that volume of blood out. If I reduce the preload, I reduce the volume of blood going to the heart that it's gonna have to work to pump out. That decreases the work it has to do, it decreases demand. So. By dilating the veins, what do I do, my friends? Dilating the veins, I'm going to inhibit the venous smooth muscle cells. I'm going to venodilate. If I venodilate, what do I do? I reduce preload. If I reduce preload, I reduce stroke volume and cardiac output, the amount of work that the heart has to do to pump that blood out of the heart. There's less volume coming into it, less work that it's gonna have to do. If there's less work, there's less demand. That's a pretty cool concept there. So that's one, that's one indication. So here's one indication there. The second thing is that the nitroglycerin not only can act as a venodilator, but it can also act as a coronary vasodilator. So here's the coronary vessel here. Very little blood flow getting through. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give this patient nitroglycerin, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna cause coronary vasodilation. And if I cause coronary vasodilation, I'm going to increase the actual blood flow to the myocardium. 
And so that'll increase maybe a little bit of the oxygen supply to the myocardium. So that was the only one that I may be able to get just a little bit more supply to the myocardium and reduce the work. That's a great drug. Again, what is this drug that'll do these two things here? This is nitroglycerin. So I want you to understand in patients who have some type of coronary artery disease or angina, whether it be unstable angina, stable angina, and STEMI, they may benefit preferably, generally, if I had to pick between a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker, the beta blocker should always be first, the calcium channel blocker should be second, and if a patient develops symptomatic angina, so unstable angina, or they develop NSTEMI, they have chest pain, nitroglycerin may be very helpful for symptomatic control to again, venodilate, reduce oxygen demand, and give a little bit of coronary vasodilation, so to open up the actual coronary vessel to give more blood flow to the myocardium, okay? So that's the particular indications for this situation. Okay, a lot of stuff there. Okay, the next indications that I wanna talk about here besides a patient who's tachycardic, a patient who has stable plaques within their vessels or maybe an unstable plaque that uh, ruptured and again, they have a reduced supply and we're trying to reduce their demand. The next situation here is a patient just had a myocardial infarction. So they just you know jacked up a piece of their myocardium or they have heart failure, so systolic heart failure where their heart isn't pumping in general. So the basic problem with this disease is what? The basic problem is, is that the heart is not pumping out very well. There is a decrease cardiac output that's being generated by the left ventricle. It's not very good, the contractility's down. So because of that, it's having difficulty being able to get blood out of the left ventricle and into the aortic circulation and into the systemic circulation, right? So there is a reduction in cardiac output. The problem with that is whenever you have a reduction in cardiac output because patients are post MI or have heart failure, systolic heart failure, is it loves to activate those baroreceptors, my friends, and they pick up from the, you know, carotid, um, the carotid sinus and the aortic sinus and they send this information to your central nervous system. From your central nervous system, you activate your sympathetic nervous system that increases the release of norepinephrine. And what we know is that norepinephrine will then go and do what? It'll act on the heart, on the beta receptors, and it'll act on the blood vessels to do what? A lot of pr problematic things here. So one of the things that it's gonna do is it's gonna act on the heart, and it's gonna try to do one nasty thing here. So if we increase norepinephrine, let's actually say, if it works on norepinephrine, so we increase norepinephrine release, if it increases norepinephrine release, what's it gonna do to the beta-1 receptors? So on the beta-1 receptors, it's going to stimulate them and do what? Increase heart rate and increase contractility. This poor heart is already weak. You're gonna weaken it even more, okay? You're gonna weaken it even more by doing that. So by doing this, by stimulating the beta-1 receptors, you're gonna weaken the heart even more. That's terrible. So I, I'm, 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 what am I doing? By increasing my heart rate, I'm doing what? Heart rate and contractility, I'm doing what to the heart? I'm weakening it. <sighs> well, that's a problematic thing. Well, here's the other thing. Not only is norepinephrine gonna increase the activation of the beta-1 receptors, it's also gonna stimulate the alpha-1 receptors. What's that gonna do? That's going to cause increased systemic vascular resistance and it's gonna increase preload. So now, if I increase systemic vascular resistance, I'm gonna squeeze down in these arteries and I'm gonna make it harder for blood to even get out of the heart because I'm gonna increase afterload. Oh my gosh. So if I increase my systemic vascular resistance, I increase afterload. That weakens the heart even more, makes it even more difficult to get blood out of the heart. Poor thing. Now, I also am going to increase preload. So I'm gonna give it more blood. <laughs> so I'm gonna fill it up. I'm gonna congest it, and I'm gonna have, have more blood, unfortunately, and weaken it even more. So you see how this is problematic, right? So what I can do is I can give drugs that block the beta-1 receptors, that block the alpha-1 receptors, and patients who are post-MI and CHF. What are the drugs that actually can block beta-1 receptors? That would be one particular thing. But if I also had drugs that block the beta and alpha, ooh, I do have drugs that do that. So. One category would be selective, selective beta-1 blockers. So beta-1 blockers. 
That would be your atenolol, bersoprolol, metoprolol, esmolol, etc. The other one is your alpha and beta blockers. Labetalol, carvedilol, carvedilol more particularly is really, really good at this. So I would actually remember that uh, with carvedilol actually being way more powerful than labetalol, especially in patients who are post MI and CHF. But you're going to get way more potent effect here from the selective beta 1 blockers. So metoprolol tends to be one of the most commonly utilized ones in patients who are post MI or CHF. Because again, you're reducing heart rate contractility. That's one of the big things that will really weaken the heart. But again, if you have a drug that actually has the ability to reduce alpha-1 blockade, you can reduce afterload, which helps to, again, get more blood out of the heart, and reduce preload, which helps to prevent as much blood coming back to the heart, congesting it even more, which is beneficial. So carvedilol tends to be way better than labetalol in that situation. Okay, so that's that. Now, here's that's the, not the only problem, though. The norepinephrine, not only does it increase the stimulation of beta-1 receptors, alpha-1 receptors, but it also stimulates one more that stimulates beta-1 receptors that are present on the kidney. And that will actually increase renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, ADH system. And that can also be somewhat problematic. Plus, if you have a reduction in cardiac output, that also stimulates the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And so they may have potential benefits. So if I stimulate the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system because I have a low cardiac output, low blood pressure, activate the baroreceptors and they stimulate that reflex, that's one way. Plus, if I have a low cardiac output, I actually don't perfuse the kidneys well, the JG cells get ticked off and release renin. And that activates the system. So won't those drugs also be good? Yes, let's talk about how they do that. Come down here with me for a second. All right, so again, we've talked about how beta blockers will work. Potentially in the post MICHF, they'll inhibit the beta-1 receptors, which will inhibit the increase in heart rate, inhibit the increase in contractility, which will, again, prevent the weakening of the heart. And that's actually really good because it can reduce mortality within this disease. And then if you have drugs that actually inhibit the alpha-1 receptors, they can reduce the systemic vascular resistance, reduce the preload, and again, reduce the ability to continue to weaken the heart because they're going to undergo dilation or hypertrophy, all of that. And then I also may inhibit the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So beta blockers more particularly inhibits the beta-1 receptors. And then alpha blockers and beta blockers, like labetalol, carvedilol, particularly carvedilol, will inhibit both of these processes, which is pretty cool. Now coming back to this situation here, patient's sympathetic nervous system is activated. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, because again, if you knock out this left ventricle where because you had an MI, you have very poor you know, cardiac output because there's a, you know, a decrease in systolic function here, right? So the whole point here is there's a reduction in cardiac output. The other thing here is that if there was a reduction in cardiac output and a reduction in blood pressure, that'll activate those, you know, carotid sinuses, aortic sinuses, which will go to your medulla. Medulla will then activate the sympathetic nervous system, and this will come down to the kidneys and activate the, what types of receptors here? They'll activate the beta-1 receptors on the JG cells of the kidney. The other thing is that if you have a low cardiac output, that'll activate the JG cells in the kidney. If you activate the JG cells in the kidney, they then will release renin. Renin then converts this molecule made by the liver, which is called angiotensinogen, into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then acted on by an enzyme in the lungs called angiotensin converting enzyme which will convert this into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 then has many different effects, which we've already discussed, right? One of them is that it can go over here to the arteries and act on angiotensin 2 receptors and do what? It can stimulate them, which can increase systemic vascular resistance, increase your blood pressure. And because of that, not only does it increase resistance, it also increases afterload, the other thing here is that angiotensin 2 can also act on the veins, on the angiotensin 2 receptors here, and that can do what? That can increase the preload, increase the stroke volume, cardiac output, and increase the blood pressure. And again, the whole point here is that if we increase preload, we're actually going to push more blood into the heart. Right? If we push more blood into the heart, it's going to get congested. So one of the things that we're already noticing here with an increase in angiotensin 2, which is the problematic guy here, is that when you increase angiotensin 2, is you're going to increase systemic vascular resistance, and that's going to increase afterload. That's going to put a lot of strain on the heart. That's going to weaken it. 
It's also going to increase preload, which is going to, again, increase the what? It's going to increase the strain of the heart, and it's also going to cause it to become congested. So if you cause it to become congested because of an increase in preload, and then you, because of the high afterload, you cause it to become very weak over time. The other thing here is that angiotensin II also acts where? On the adrenal cortex to pump out more aldosterone. And then aldosterone does what? Acts on the kidneys. And what it does is it actually is supposed to stimulate sodium and water reabsorption. And so what it'll do is it'll actually cause more sodium and more water to go into the bloodstream. And so then you'll have an increase in blood volume, an increase in preload. And it's the same concept here. So it'll actually stimulate aldosterone, which will do the same thing. So aldosterone will also, so we'll just put here aldosterone, is also going to be increased, but that just stimulates this increase in preload and causes the heart to become more congested. So this is a problem. This is a, this is a really terrible situation here because in a patient who has a post-MI or CHF, by doing all of these things, what are you doing? You're weakening that poor heart. So what if I, what if I gave two particular drugs, or three drugs? One drug category is an ACE inhibitor. What that'll do is that'll actually reduce angiotensin II. Less angiotensin II means less vasoconstriction of the arteries and the veins. That reduces afterload, that reduces the strain on the heart, prevents it from getting weak, reduces the preload, reduces the uh, stroke volume and the cardiac output, reduces the congestion of the heart, which helps to play a role within reducing CHF sickness. And then it also inhibits aldosterone production, which reduces further preload. The same thing, if I gave a drug that blocked angiotensin II from binding onto all of these receptors, I would get the same effect. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs would have what potential benefit here? They're really good in patients who have CHF and post-MI and post because they would, both of them, reduce preload and they would also reduce afterload, which helps to prevent weakening of the heart. There's one more. And this is more particularly for the CHF picture, but you can think about it in post-MI as well, and that's aldosterone antagonists. If you give an aldosterone antagonist, like what? Like the eplernone or the amylaride, these may be beneficial to be able to do what? Reduce preload, and again, reduce that progressive congestion of the heart. And what's really interesting is that all of these drugs the beta blockers, alpha beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and aldosterone antagonists have all been shown to be able to reduce mortality in patients who have CHF, and in some degree post-MI. So these are the ones that I want you guys to be thinking about. So, so far we've covered patients who have tachycardias or tachyarrhythmias. We've covered patients who have maybe a stable plaque or an unstable plaque, and they have a high oxygen demand and a decreased O2 supply. How do you reduce their demand? And then we talked about patients who just had a myocardial infarction recently, maybe a couple months afterwards, or they have systolic heart failure and they're not having good cardiac output and their heart's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. How can we prevent that if they also have associated hypertension? Man, I think we're understanding this now, okay, right? So we got those beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, non dihydropyridine here. Beta blockers, non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, nitroglycerin here. Beta blockers, alpha beta blockers. We also have ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and aldosterone antagonists for this one. What about diabetes and CKD? Okay, in patients who have diabetes, really the underlying problem here is that in diabetes, they have maybe like less insulin or they have, maybe they have high insulin, whatever the problem is, there's either type one, which is the no insulin being produced or zero insulin, or type two, they have lots of insulin, it's causing resistance. But the problem here is that regardless of these two diseases, they're increasing the blood glucose levels. The problem with that is that has a really terrible effect on the kidneys and can actually progress this patient into chronic kidney disease. So diabetic nephropathy is one of the very common causes of chronic kidney disease. If a patient also has chronic kidney disease of an undetermined etiology, in other words, maybe it's hypertension related, either way, diabetes can lead to CKD, or if they have CKD from another underlying cause like hypertension, there is particular drug categories that are beneficial here. Now, let me explain. In a patient who has 
um, some type of hypertension, but they also have these two diseases. It's really interesting. Okay. In diabetes or CKD, they have poor kidneys, poor renal perfusion in general. So because of that, these patients may have a lot of renin production. Lots of renin leads to an increase in angiotensin. One, we're not going to go through this mechanism I'm crazy, but increases angiotensin. Two, and then angiotensin two will do what? Here is your afferent arterial, blood's going into the glomerulus. And then here is the efferent arterial, blood is leaving the glomerulus here and then exiting out this way. Angiotensin II has a very, very powerful effect on the efferent arterial. What does it normally do? The normal effect of angiotensin II here is to cause efferent arterial vasoconstriction, right? It stimulates that process that increases the glomerular blood pressure. So the pressure inside of this glomerulus here is now gonna be very, very high because I'm squeezing down here. So I'm reducing blood exiting here. So less blood is gonna be coming out of the glomerulus and more of it's gonna be staying in the glomerulus. That's gonna increase the glomerular blood pressure. That'll increase the glomerular filtration rate. That'll increase protein loss. And that'll also thicken the glomerular basement membrane from consistent stress because it's gonna to have to thicken because it's under high pressure. It has to protect itself. So you're gonna see all of this particular process here where there's lots of protein, lots of loss of potential fluids here, right? So you're gonna see potential proteinuria and an increase in the GFR. And you're also gonna see, look at this glomerular basement membrane. It's all jacked up. It's all thickened up now. And that's gonna worsen and progress in the chronic kidney disease. So thickening the glomerular basement membrane will worsen the chronic kidney disease. So it'll increase the CKD. So now we have a special enzyme that converts angiotensin one into angiotensin two. This is called ACE. We have a potential receptor here called an angiotensin two receptor where angiotensin two binds onto. <laughs> if I give a drug such as a what? ACE inhibitor. Oh man, we good. ACE inhibitor such as lisinopril, captopril, enalapril, right? It's going to inhibit this enzyme. It's going to inhibit angiotensin one into angiotensin two. It's going to decrease or inhibit the levels of angiotensin two. If I give an angiotensin two receptor blocker, it's going to inhibit the angiotensin two from binding onto the receptor. What is the overall summative effect of these things then? Oh man, if now, we block this effect here, we're going to have less angiotensin II. So less angiotensin II is gonna be occurring, whether it be less angiotensin II being formed or it's less angiotensin II binding to the receptor. So it's this or angiotensin II blockade. If it's blocked, that inhibits efferent arterial vasoconstriction. Now it's not gonna vasoconstrict, it's going to dilate. More blood flow leaves. What does it do to the glomerular blood pressure? It reduces the glomerular blood pressure. What does that do to the GFR? It increases the GFR. I'm sorry, it, it decreases, because now your, your pressure in the capillary system is gonna be lower, so you're gonna have less filtration. The hydrostatic pressure will go down. It also will decrease protein loss. Less proteins are gonna be lost in the urine, so you're going to inhibit proteinuria, which is great in diabetic nephropathy and in chronic kidney disease. And then also you're going to decrease GBM thickening. And this is great because why? Because this will decrease progression of CKD. So this will decrease the progression of CKD. Oh my gosh, these are great drugs to use in that situation then. So this is what I want you to think about when you think about patients who have diabetes and CKD, why ACE inhibitors and why ARBs are gonna be the preferred drug to give in these patients. Okay, let's move on to a couple more diseases and which ones we would use for if they have another comorbidity. All right guys, almost done, just a couple more types of antihypertensive agents that we would use in patients with underlying comorbidities. So first one, BPH. So you're probably like, BPH, what does this have? Any? I thought we were gonna go with the more realistic ones like tachyarrhythmias or patients who have CAD and agita or have some type of post in my heart failure or diabetics and CKD. Yes, yes, but BPH is important too. When you can't pee, that's problematic. So when you got a big old honking 
you know, prostate that's actually preventing you from being able to go to the bathroom and being able to pee, so it's causing retention. Sometimes what we can do is alpha blockers, right? Alpha blockers have actually been shown to be really beneficial at being able to treat the patient's blood pressure as well as being able to inhibit the internal urethral sphincter. So if you inhibit the internal urethral sphincter, this helps to be able to promote urination, which is a very beneficial thing in a patient who has retention secondary to BPH. So that might be a benefit in this particular category, such as alpha blocker. So prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin, et cetera. Osteoporosis, like what the heck? <laughs> in osteoporosis, sometimes the problem is that they're breaking down lots and lots of bone, very, very porous bone. And because of that, you're actually breaking down tons of bone that you may not have enough calcium to put back into the bone. And patients who are taking what's called thiazide diuretics, so thiazides, what thiazides do is yes, they inhibit sodium and water retention. Yes, that is absolutely the case. And so that'll drop your blood volume and then through the mechanisms we talked about before, drop your blood pressure. But here's the thing that it also does. It also stimulates calcium reabsorption. And if you increase calcium in the bloodstream, you can use this calcium to deposit into the bone in patients who have osteoporosis. So thiazides are also beneficial in patients who have hypertension, but they also have osteoporosis because one of the adverse effects can actually be a benefit, which is hypercalcemia. All right, the next one, pregnancy. Patient is pregnant, there is many different drugs that you really want to avoid. And so instead of remembering the ones that you want to avoid, just remember the ones that you really are safe, have a good safety profile and you'd want to give. Those particular drugs that you'd want to give, let's actually write these down in nice red so we remember them, is healthy moms love nifedipine. So the first one is obviously nifedipine. So this is that dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. So that's a pretty safe drug. The other one is labetalol, which is an alpha beta blocker. The other one is methyl dopa, but you're probably like methyl dopa, don't worry, throw the alpha in front of it. <laughs> and then the last one here is hydralazine. So these happen to be very, very safe in patients who are pregnant. So consider these on the exams if they present that. All right, <laughs> with COPD and asthma, the basic concept here is that you really wanna reduce the bronchospasm, you wanna reduce a lot of the coughing that comes from that disease. So you have to think here, I have different types of receptors here, right? One is I have beta two receptors. The other thing is that there's a lot of capillaries that are controlling the blood supply to the submucosa here. And so I really don't want a lot of like leaky vessels. So I think the biggest thing to think about is really which drugs to not give to patients who have COPD and asthma, because the, the list is a little bit shorter and then you can remember anything else would be safe. So the drugs that you should not give to patients with COPD and asthma is you don't wanna give drugs that block the beta-2 receptors. If you give a drug that inhibits the beta-2 receptors, what are you gonna do? This is going to promote, it's gonna stimulate bronchospasm. Because you're, generally uh, beta-2 receptors, when they're stimulated, they actually promote bronchodilation. If you inhibit that, it can cause bronchospasm. And that can worsen the COPD and asthma. On top of that, there's a particular situations here where when you give a patient what's called an ACE inhibitor, an ACE inhibitor is actually important because what it's gonna do is it's going to inhibit an enzyme called ACE. And ACE will take a molecule called bradykinins and convert it into these inactive metabolites. And if you give an ACE inhibitor, you inhibit the ACE enzyme, inhibit bradykinins from being broken down and increase bradykinins. And bradykinins actually promote a lot of vasodilation and capillary permeability and they increase cap permeability. And that causes swelling, angioedema and coughing. So avoid, the drugs to avoid is ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Let's actually put these over here. The beta blockers. Any other drug may actually be potentially beneficial or safe
to give to patients who have COPD asthma. So avoid beta blockers, more specifically the non-selective, so labetalol, carvedilol, propanolol, not as much so metoprolol, esmolol, um, and uh, atenolol, asbutalol, basoprolol. Minor, minor effect of bronchospasm, but primarily labetalol, carvedilol, propanolol, avoid those. And then avoid ACE inhibitors. ARBs, they have a very mild, very, 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 very low chance of angioedema. But again, very, very mild, very, very low chance. So again, ARBs would be safe. Um, any kind of like dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker will be safe. Hydralazine, any of those drugs that we've talked about before, besides these would be potentially safe to give in a patient with COPD or asthma. Just avoid ACE inhibitors and avoid beta blockers. All right, so that covers all of the patients who have hypertension with an associated comorbidity, such as we've covered in this lecture, we covered um, tachyarrhythmias, we covered uh, angina, whether it would be unstable, whether it be stable, whether it be instemi, we covered post-MI, congestive heart failure, we covered um, potentially patients who have diabetic uh, diabetes or CKD, we covered BPH, osteoporosis, pregnancy, and we finished off with which ones to avoid in COPD asthma. Now let's talk about the patient population that is uncomplicated. They don't have any of these particular diseases, relatively healthy, but they have essential hypertension. Which are the best antihypertensives for these patients to know? Let's talk about that. All right, so the first one that I want you to think about is three categories. So patient who is not old, all right, is non-African American, has, has, has high hypertension. Those who are not elderly are African American, have hypertension, and those who are elderly with hypertension. Okay, regardless if they're African-American or non-African-American. The reason why is this has been studied, okay, and there's been shown to be potential benefit um, within particular agents in essential hypertension in these three categories. So if they're non-elderly, non-African-American, they may benefit from potential first-line medications such as ACE inhibitors or ARBs. And then another thing that you could combine with that, so I could do an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, really is one of the options here. And then the last thing I would also consider here, if you had to do combination therapy, so generally with a patient, I may start off with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, and then after I start these off, if the patient is still not reaching their goal, which maybe I'm targeting a goal blood pressure less than 140 over 90, but they're not meeting it with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, I would obviously increase the dosage, but if they're still not meeting it, then what I would do is I'd add on another drug. And the drugs that seem to be beneficial in these patients are thiazide diuretics. So thiazides, so chlorthalidone, chlorthiazides, these tend to be very, very beneficial in these patients. Okay, so again, non-elderly, non-African American with hypertension, ACE inhibitors, or, it's important to remember that, you don't wanna give both of these, or ARBs, for, and then another thing that you can add on here, plus or minus, plus, minus, thiazide diuretics, okay? So like hydrochlorothiazide, chlorthalidone, chlorothiazide, metolazone, not so much, but those are pretty generously, you know, decent agents in treating hypertension. For patients who's non-elderly African-American, there's been shown to be benefit not from the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, and the reason why is patients with African-American are referred to as what's called having what's called low renin hypertension. So these patients have been studied to have low renin hypertension. So therefore, they will not benefit from the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. So what we found is that these patients really, really benefit primarily from the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. They really respond well to that. And so the categories that you wanna remember for this one is the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers tend to be the best one for these patients. And then the plus or minus that you can add on here, so this is amlodipine, nifedipine, nimodipine, things of that nature. The one that you can add on if they're still not reaching their goal is you could add on what next? Then you could add on a thiazide diuretic, okay? So again, hydrochlorothiazide, chlorthalidone, chlorothiazide, these are pretty decent drugs to be able to give to these particular patients, okay? And then again, the next one here um, to be able to talk about is again, patients who are elderly with underlying hypertension. So in these patients, what I really want you guys to think about here is that this is really gonna be <laughs> what we found to be the most beneficial here is patients really respond well to dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. If they're elderly, again, regardless of what a African-American, non-African-American, they found that there's most benefit from the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. So this is the preferred 
agents to give in this situation. And then again, if the patient is not meeting goal, it's important to be able to be very cognizant and think about which category would they be ben most beneficial from. So look through their history. Do they have diabetes, CKD? Maybe they'll benefit from an ACE inhibitor or an ARP. Do they have some type of CAD or angina? Maybe they'll benefit from a beta blocker. Maybe they'll benefit from some other type of drug. Okay, do they have heart failure? Maybe they'll benefit maybe hydralazine or isosorbide dinitrate, especially if they're African American. So thinking about those things and being thoughtful is really, really important. Okay, so now that we know if a patient has essential hypertension without any true comorbidities, there's four first line agents for essential hypertension. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, thiazides, and dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. If they're non-elderly, non-African American, they have hypertension, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, thiazides. If they're African American, non-elderly with hypertension, they don't respond to ACE inhibitors, ARBs. So dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, thiazides. If they're elderly with hypertension, regardless of their race, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Okay. Now what we gotta do is we have a patient who is, has a history of hypertension, right? They have a history of hypertension. Their blood pressure is not being well controlled. So maybe they've been on multiple blood pressure medications. Maybe they've been taking their amlodipine and then they recently got put on a thiazide and then maybe even they got put on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. But their blood pressure is not well controlled, okay? Or maybe they're not taking their medications and their blood pressure goes up and up and up and up and it starts pumping up into the greater than 180 systolic over 120 diastolic. And then all of a sudden they start having target organ damage, complications. What would this look like? Because it's important to know what these things look like and then how to treat these patients with what agents depending upon the type of target organ damage they have. Let's get over there and talk about that. Last situation here is we have a patient who's supposed to be on a bunch of antihypertensives, okay? They have a hypertension and they're supposed to be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. They're supposed to be on their thiazide. They're supposed to be on their dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. And maybe they're taking a beta blocker because they have coronary artery disease or AFib, whatever. But the whole point is they're supposed to be on these medications. They're not taking it. So they decide to not take it and then their blood pressure is like 3,000 over 20,000. But you get the point, it's, it's just, it's stinking high. And the real number that we care about is when that blood pressure is like really pumping up. So greater than 180 systolic over 120 diastolic is concerning, okay? But really what's concerning is not just the number, it's if they have target organ damage. Target organ damage, target organ damage, target organ damage is most important because that is what determines a hypertensive emergency, not the number. If they have no target organ damage, it could be a hypertensive urgency, which may be a different treatment process. But if they have greater than 180 over 20 and they have some evidence of target organ damage that is present, that is a hypertensive emergency and you gotta treat these patients really quickly. You gotta get on top of them. So what does it look like? Well, if the blood pressure skyrocketed in the head, it's gonna pop every vessel in the brain, right? So they can end up with like a subarachnoid hemorrhage, they can end up with an ICH, they can end up with what's called PREZ. So look out for potential complications here, such as maybe an acute ischemic stroke is potential. They can rip open a plaque in the you know, vessel wall. Um, an intracerebral hemorrhage, they can cause an aneurysm, maybe a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or maybe they can have something called PREZ. The biggest thing is if they present with an altered mental status. We call it encephalopathy. So PREZ can actually cause seizures, but if a patient has like an altered mental status and they're encephalopathic from their high blood pressure, these are neurological emergencies that you gotta be careful of because of that BP. The other thing is if it gets into the eye and it actually starts kind of causing a lot of edema um, around the actual um, optic disc, it can actually cause something called papilledema. So watch out for this too. So this could be a potential sign here of a lot of high intracranial pressure. So it could be secondary to high ICPs. And again, indicative that there's just a lot of cerebral perfusion pressure because the blood pressure is like through the roof. The next thing here is if it actually has pro profound effects on the cardiovascular system. So whenever you have a patient whose blood pressure is extremely high, what happens is, I want you to think about it like this. When the blood pressure is really, really high, Okay, whenever you have a very, very high blood pressure out here in the systemic circulation, that high BP correlates to a very high afterload. Okay, and that high afterload puts a lot of strain on the heart. So now this poor left ventricle is gonna have to pump blood that it's getting filled with out into this extremely high pressure circulation. And so if a patient's BP in their systemic circulation is through the roof, the afterload is gonna be through the roof. And because of that, it's gonna make it so hard for the left ventricle to get blood out. And so that increases the demand of the heart. So that really, really increases the demand and oxygen demand of the heart. Why is that a problem? If a patient already has a reduced O2 supply because they have coronary artery disease, that can increase the actual ischemia 
if they have on top of this, they have a decreased O2 supply because they have coronary artery disease. So they have a plaque within their vessel, right? So they have CAD. Because of that, it can cause ischemia. And that ischemia can lead to maybe an acute coronary syndrome. So this may cause an unstable angina. This may cause an end STEMI. These are really scary situations where it may even cause an infarct of the myocardial tissue. So watch out for these particular things. The other interesting thing here is that on the vessels, if you imagine if the blood pressure is like so high in these vessels, you're gonna rip right through the vessel wall. The tunica entoma doesn't stand a chance. And because of that, you can create this false lumen within the vessel. And so you're just gonna shear force rip through the tunica intima and then create this like false lumen within the blood vessels. What's that called? An aortic dissection. Eww. So again, increased blood pressure may increase the risk of an aortic dissection. So I think one potential thing to watch out for here is again, any kind of myocardial ischemia, any aortic dissection, papilla edema, neurological emergency. What else? This one's really interesting. Whenever you have a super, super high afterload, not only does it cause a very massive increased demand on the heart, but it makes it super impossible to get blood out of the heart as well. <laughs> so not only does it increase the demand and now the myocardium is like, oh my gosh, I can't handle this. It's also gonna say, I can't push the blood out of the heart. <laughs> so because of that, blood stays in the heart and then backs up into the lungs. So because of this massive increase in afterload, what this does is this decreases the left ventricular cardiac output. And if you decrease the left ventricular cardiac output, blood is not gonna go out of the heart, it's actually gonna back up into the pulmonary circulation. And that's gonna cause it to kind of leak out into the actual pulmonary interstitial spaces and cause massive pulmonary edema. And so watch out because of that, because it decreased left ventricular cardiac output, it causes backflow. And that backflow can lead to massive pulmonary edema. We call this flash pulmonary edema or sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema. So watch out for that as well. So if I have a patient who's altered, they have papilla edema, they have a ischemic heart, so an end STEMI or an un, a, a unstable angina, they have flash pulmonary edema, they have an aortic dissection, and then what else? Dang, blood pressure so high, I'm going to blow the renal capsules open, baby. So I won't stop until I got people peeing out blood. And so because of that, that blood pressure is going to be so high, it's going to be blowing up glomeruli and causing these patients to have massive acute kidney injuries. Imagine, you got so much blood pressure and you start blowing up those glomeruli, you think they're going to work really well and give you good glomerular filtration rates? No. And then what's going to end up happening is you're going to have lots of red cells popping out into your urine. So watch out for these patients to have hematuria. And then also you're gonna blow up their glomeruli, so you're gonna cause these patients to have a really good acute kidney injury and hematuria. So watch out for acute kidney injuries and associated hematuria with these patients. If the patient comes in, they got a blood pressure greater than 180 over 120 and they have any of these findings, they now have a hypertensive emergency. And these patients need to be treated quickly. What we want to do is, is we want to take the blood pressure of greater than 180 over 120, and we want to slowly titrate that down. And what we want to do is maybe over a couple hours, a few hours, I want to drop that down to maybe, I don't know, 25%. You know, no greater than 25% of this. So that's what I want to do. I want to drop it down by 25%. And then over another couple hours, I'll drop it down to less than 160. And then over another couple hours, I'll drop it down to their baseline blood pressure, where they're supposed to be. Okay, but that's the whole concept here is we're doing this over a certain period of time over hours to days. Okay, it's not a process where I'm just going to be like, all right, they're, you know, 200 over 110. Let's get them to 130 right now, baby. No, you do that. You drop their pressure that fast. You're going to decrease the perfusion to all of these organs that have been expecting to have high perfusion. You will stroke them out. You'll end up with an MI you'll end up with a terrible acute kidney injury. So because of that, do not drop their blood pressure too quickly. Do it nice and slow and allow for them to be able to auto-regulate. Now the big question is, 
And so we talked about what agents are really good for patients in outpatient scenarios. So patients who have hypertension plus this comorbidity, patients who have hypertension with no comorbidity. What about the patients who have a hypertensive emergency? Which agents do I grab? Do I just do all the ones that I told you? Oh, here, take some oral captopril and you'll be good, brother. No, no, you gotta have particular agents that you know and prescribe. So let's talk about those. Let's come down to the choices that we have there. All right, so you got a patient comes in, they got a blood pressure of greater than 180 over 120, and now they got a big old blood pocket in their brain, right? So maybe they have uh, an acute ischemic stroke, so maybe they infarcted parts of like their MCA territory. Or maybe they have like this big old bleed sitting here in their basal ganglia. Or maybe they have some type of like massive vasogenic edema presenting within their posterior portions of the, the brain, pres. So either way, there's some type of like finding of a neurological emergency due to their high blood pressure. So I just like to think about these as a neurological emergency. Let's actually do this in red just to you know, vary up the colors. So you have a neuro emergency. Okay, whether this be due to the things that we just mentioned, an acute ischemic stroke, so a big infarct, an ICH, you know, prez, or you know, again, subarachnoid hemorrhage, something of that nature, I gotta drop their blood pressure down. So what I'd like to do is again, titrate down slowly. If they were like pumping up in the 200s, I'm not gonna drop them down to like 140 over 90 um, within a couple hours. I gotta do that slowly because I gotta allow for their brain to adjust because it's been so used to these higher perfusion pressures. If you drop it down, oh boy, are you in trouble. So because of that, I gotta go slow. And so I'd really like a very easily titratable agent that's a nice infusion. And really what we've seen most benefit from and what I particularly prefer is actually nicardipine. I find that nicardipine is gonna be the most commonly utilized infusion because it's just nicely titratable for these patients who have some type of neurological emergency. If you want to, you can do PRN like IV boluses of labetalol and hydralazine, but I prefer to find that, I, I find that usually nicardipine is gonna be the most um, situated to be best suited in this situation. Okay, next one. We go to the cardiovascular stuff here. Okay, we got a patient here who has some type of unstable angina. They have an end STEMI. Okay, so you have a patient here who has unstable angina or they have some type of end STEMI. They got some really bad you know, coronary artery disease here, an acute coronary syndrome kind of thing, but no STEMI. If that's the case, what I really want to do here in this particular situation is I want to reduce the demand. I gotta reduce the demand. And my friends, we've already talked about these already. So here's the thing. If I have a patient who has a hypertensive emergency, I want to think about patients who have hypertension Okay, they have hypertension and they have CAD or they have some type of angina. What were the drugs? Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, nitroglycerin. I don't like to use calcium channel blockers because they can really be somewhat problematic and they're not really good, especially if a patient has like a little bit of a problem where their, cardio, their cardiac output's a little reduced. So what's actually been shown to be really, really good in this situation who has unstable angina and STEMI is a beta blocker. So that would be the first one. So again, the whole goal with these is I want to reduce the demand, right? So with these, the whole goal is to reduce demand. And so the way that I'm gonna do that is one particular drug that I uh, think is really, really decent here is Esmolol. So Esmolol may be a pretty good infusion that you can give to people, and it's easily titratable that can actually work as a beta blocker. So this is a beta blocker, pure beta one blocker. So it's gonna reduce heart rate, reduce contractility, and reduce demand. The other one that you can give is labetalol. This is not an infusion, it's not a truly titratable agent, so this will be an IV push. But again, this is a alpha beta blocker. So it may be good to be able to block the beta receptors to give you, again, a reduced heart rate, a reduced contractility, and reduce the demand, but you also get a reduced in afterload. So that may also be a somewhat benefit in these patients. And the last one here is gonna be nitroglycerin. But I really want you to remember that this is actually gonna be low dose nitroglycerin. So this is low dose nitroglycerin, why? Because nitroglycerin is actually going to work particularly, I'm gonna kind of highlight this one, I'm gonna put a blue check mark here. What it's gonna do is it's actually going to venodilate. And because it venodilates, what does it do to the preload? It reduces the preload. If you reduce the preload to the heart, what do you do to the stroke volume? You drop preload, 
you drop stroke volume, you drop cardiac output, you drop the work or demand required by the heart. Plus, what else does nitroglycerin do? We already talked about this. It takes a coronary vessel that has this plaque here, all right? So here's the plaque within this vessel, and it can do what to the coronary vessel here? It can cause coronary vasodilation. So it's also pretty good because it can stimulate coronary vasodilation. So these are drugs that we can actually give to patients who are having some type of angina, unstable angina or instemi secondary to their blood pressure being greater than 180 over 120 as a complication of that. Okay, next one here, patient has an aortic dissection. So if they have an aortic dissection, again, the problem with this one is I really wanna just reduce the amount of blood that's getting pumped out of the heart all right, because if I reduce the amount of blood getting pumped out of the heart, I reduce the amount of blood that can just keep filling into this dang aortic dissection. That's really where the money's at. Yes, if I can get a little bit of a vasodilatory effect, I can also reduce the resistance, but it's gonna be more beneficial for me to reduce the amount of blood getting out of the left heart. So what I wanna do is, in this situation here, I wanna try to reduce the actual um, cardiac output is really what I prefer. And then the second agent that I can add on there to give a little bit more of a vasodilatory effect, a powerful arterial vasodilation, would be the second thing that I can do. So aortic dissections, if we wanna drop the cardiac output, one of the particular agents that we can use in this situation is esmolol. So esmolol will actually work as, again, as a beta blocker, and that's a great infusion that you get a really good control over. You could consider labetalol as well because you'll get a combination here. You'll get a combination, um, and again, it's an IV push, but it is an alpha beta blocker, and so you may get some benefit because it's actually gonna reduce cardiac output by heart rate drop and contractility drop, and also vasodilate the vessel to reduce resistance. The last agent, I really don't use it because of the risk of cyanide toxicity, subsequent lactic acidosis, and coronary steel syndrome, um, but you could consider nitroprusside. Um, but I, if I'm gonna use a vasodilator, instead of me going with nitroprusside, I would actually prefer to just go with a better vasodilator, like nicardipine, okay? So if I'm really going with a vasodilator, a pure vasodilator, I'm gonna go with nicardipine way over nitroprusside, first thing, okay? So that's how what we would do for a patient who has like an acute aortic dissection. Okay, the next situation here is someone has sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema or flash pulmonary edema. So they have a massive or flash pulmonary edema. I like to call it SCAPE, sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema. But the basic concept here is that the patient has massive increased left ventricular afterload, okay? And I'm having difficulty getting the blood out of the left heart. So the problem is, is the afterload is so dang high that because the, the BP in the aortic circulation is so high, I'm having difficulty in getting blood out. So because of that, blood is backing up into the lungs and causing massive pulmonary edema. So what I wanna do is I want to improve afterload. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give a drug that's gonna really, really reduce afterload. So I'm gonna give a drug that's really gonna try to bring down the afterload. That's really what I want it to do. I want it to reduce the afterload. And so the way that I'm gonna to try to reduce the afterload is I'm gonna give a drug that it's a very powerful arterial vasodilator. So you would think, oh, nitroprusside. Oh, nicardipine. <laughs> In a way, yes, but there's another drug that's really good because if I give it a high doses, it dilates the arteries and it dilates the veins. Nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin is great in this situation. Now, what nitroglycerin is gonna do is it's going to at high doses, high doses. I'm talking like you gotta get up to the 400 mic range for these sometimes, maybe even higher. Uh, sometimes even 800 mics. But generally when you give it nitroglycerin, what it's gonna do is it's going to, it's gonna cause arterial vasodilation. So it's gonna decrease systemic vascular resistance. That'll decrease the afterload. The other thing is it's gonna dilate the veins and it's gonna decrease preload. And so what that's gonna do is, if you do both of these things, that's really, really helpful in flash pulmonary edema. Here's why. If I reduce the resistance, I drop the afterload, I improve forward flow. At the same time, if I drop preload, I reduce the actual amount of blood coming into the heart, congesting it even more, causing more fluid to accumulate and back up into the lungs. 
You see what I'm saying? So that's a benefit to nitroglycerin, is if I give this drug at high doses, I get arterial vasodilation, reduces afterload, improves forward flow, and also I can drop preload, which reduces the venous return to the heart, reduces the amount of volume that's in the heart and prevents backflow uh, back into the lungs. And so this is what I could use in that particular situation. Uh, engineers, we covered a lot with these antihypertensives. I, I truly hope that you guys, uh, you know, like this video, and I hope it made sense. I really thank you guys for sticking around throughout this whole process. But guess what? We ain't done. We got to do some cases if we really want to understand this and never forget it. Let's do some cases to cement this stuff into our brain. All right, guys, so let's do some cases. So here we have a 55-year-old non-Hispanic male, uh, black male, um, has hypertension, past medical history, includes diabetes, hyperlipidemia, according to the ACC AHA guidelines, which among the choices represents the most appropriate blood pressure goal for the patient. So generally, the blood pressure when it's high, obviously we talked about this before, is that high blood pressure is characterized as generally 140, uh, greater than 140 over 90. So having a blood pressure just below that is probably not ideal. It might actually be nice to bring them down to below stage one. So maybe less than 130 over 80 would be a particularly decent goal because if you bring them down to less than 140 over 90, they're still at stage one hypertension. So bringing them down to like this point of less than 130 over 80, which is stage one, might be beneficial obviously, right? So that should be kind of a target blood pressure goal for most patients is generally gonna be less than 130 over 80. That should be a decent long-term goal for these patients. All right. All right. Second question here. 59 year old um, non-Hispanic white patient presents for the treatment of hypertension, past medical history pertinent for diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. Patient's blood pressure is 150 over 93. That's elevated. That's stage two, both today and the last visit. So that's two blood pressure measurements that are high. So that definitely kind of qualifies them for hypertension, which is a recommended initial therapy to treat hypertension in this patient. Okay. They have hypertension and then one other comorbidity that is mentioned there, diabetes. With diabetes, what is the medications that are best? I told you this because it prevents the diabetic nephropathy. It would be ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Is there an ACE inhibitor? Yes, enalapril. And so this would be the preferred agent in this particular scenario. So the answer should be enalapril because it's going to reduce the diabetic nephropathy effect and reduce proteinuria. All right, question three. 45 year old male complains of constipation was recently started on two antihypertensives due to his elevated blood pressure current medications include lisinopril chlorthalidone verapamil rosuvastatin and aspirin which is most likely contributing to his constipation so which one of the antihypertensives are in contributing here well, lisinopril has nothing to do with you know the smooth muscle particularly within the git chlorthalidone it's a thiazide um, verapamil is a calcium channel blocker so remember, there's calcium channels that are present on smooth muscle cells that are also within the GIT. So you can definitely cause inhibition of the smooth muscle contraction leading to constipation. So verapamil definitely is a likely cause here. All right. Holy crap, this patient's all jacked up. So which antihypertensive medication can cause the rare side effect of angioedema via inhibiting the um, bradykinin breakdown? Um, so bradykinin's build, 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 build and cause massive capillary leakage and vasodilatory effect. This would be ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors are going to be the most common cause in this situation. And the prills, again, that should give it away. I never mentioned this on the board, but it has a prill on it. So it's likely a ACE inhibitor. 52 year old female has uncontrolled hypertension. Blood pressure is, you know, through the roof on treatment with lisinopril. She recently had an MI. Um, her, so post MI, remember that's post MI. She has a past medical history in, which includes diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and osteoarthritis. Considering her compelling indications, which agent may be appropriate to add to her antihypertensive therapies? Okay, post MI and diabetes are the key comorbidities here. So for post MI, it was best to use beta blockers or it was also best to use ACE inhibitors and ARBs, but she is already on an ACE inhibitor. You can't put someone on an ACE inhibitor and an ARB. It's one or the other. She also has diabetes. Diabetes, again, because of the progression to diabetic nephropathy, these patients benefit most from ACE inhibitors or ARBs, but she's already on an ACE inhibitor, so she's not gonna benefit from an extra additional one like an ARB. So because of that, that leaves me with beta blockers. That is gonna be the primary one here that's really good post-MI. 
Okay, so I would consider beta blockers as the choice here in this opter. So clonidine, no. Olmazartan, that's an ARB, so we can't have an ARB and an ACE inhibitor. Furosemide is good for heart failure, but particularly, again, more in situations of symptomatic control. Um, and then metoprolol, that's a beta blocker. So I would go with metoprolol just because it's going to give you the benefit of treating the post-MI patient. All right. Blood pressure for a patient with essential hypertension is at goal on treatment with enalapril. She uh, was since initiation of enalapril, the serum creatinine has increased 25% above baseline. That's pretty normal because again, it's decreasing the glomerular blood pressure by causing reduction of the efferent arterial vasoconstriction. So that's pretty natural for them to have a bump in their creatinine and a drop in their GFR. Doesn't mean that you got to stop the medication. I would just continue. If the patient had an acute kidney injury um, where she developed some problem and then on top of that, she's also taking her ACE inhibitor or an ARB. That's a different situation. I would consider maybe holding it or, you know, maybe reducing the dose. But in this situation, the patient doesn't have an acute kidney injury. She just has a mild bump in her creatinine. That doesn't mean that I got to stop this. So I'm not going to discontinue this. I'm not going to reduce the dose. I'm just going to continue the current dose of enalapril. So that would be my option there. If she developed a significant increase in her uh, BU and creatinine, then that's a different story. And because maybe she has an acute kidney injury on top of the medication. So then that may be a different story. But in this situation, there's no problem. It's just causing a uh, G increase in the creatinine due to the decrease in GFR because you're reducing the glomerular blood pressure, reducing the glomerular filtration rate. Which of the following correctly outlines a major difference in electrolyte disturbances associated with thiazide and loop diuretics? Okay, so a major difference. So pretty straightforward. Uh, thiazides actually increase calcium and uh, loops de decrease calcium. So any one of these that actually says that. Um, so thiazides increase calcium, loops decrease calcium. That's pretty straightforward. That's the main kind of electrolyte difference because they both can cause maybe a mild degree of hyponatremia, but it, believe it or not, um, with thiazide diuretics, they actually can cause you to produce dilute, dilute urine. So they actually may cause more of a hypernatremia, especially if you're continuously, continuously giving loop diuretics in massive doses. But it can kind of cause mild hyponatremia. Um, they can drop the potassium. So you're going to want to watch out for hypokalemia. They can drop your magnesium, so maybe a little bit of hypomagnesemia. They can also cause metabolic alkalosis, maybe a teensy bit of dehydration, but that's mainly you give it in patients who are pretty much hypervolemic or volume overloaded. Um, so that is the kind of concepts in hyperlipidemia, hyperuricemia, hyperglycemia, et cetera. But the big difference in electrolytes is calcium. Thiazides actually increase calcium reabsorption. Thiazides cause calcium, I'm sorry, loops cause calcium loss. So it should be D. All right, which can precipitate a hypertensive crisis following the abrupt discontinuation or cessation of therapy? I remember I told you this one, clonidine. Clonidine is very powerful when you think about the mechanism of action, how it really helps to suppress the central drive of norepinephrine, which can lead to beta blockade on the heart, reduce heart rate contractility, alpha blockade on the arteries, decrease resistance, and then also alpha blockade on the veins, decrease preload. So it has a pretty significant effect there. If you go ahead and just get rid of something that's suppressing the central norepinephrine release and you just stop it, you're going to have a massive norepinephrine surge and it's going to really hit those uh, beta receptors and alpha receptors hard and really really jack up the blood pressure and heart rate. So watch out for clonidine for a complete rebound hypertension. Really scary one. Which of the following is a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker? Remember, these are the ones that bind onto the vascular smooth muscle. They primarily act on the vascular smooth muscle, but they have no effect on the nodal cells or the contractile cells of the heart. That is always the amlodipine, nifedipine, nicardipine, nimodipine, clavidipine. So amlodipine is one of the options here. Verapamil diltiazem are non-dihydropyridine, so they act primarily on the heart. Okay, the nodal cells, contractile cells, but they have a little bit of vasodilatory effect. Verapamil more than diltiazem. All right. Last question here. 45-year-old male will start on a, a therapy for hypertension, developed a persistent dry cough, which is the most likely responsible for this side effect. Remember, bradykinins are related to this. So you need an ACE inhibitor to reduce the breakdown of bradykinins into inactive metabolites. Increased bradykinin causes a little bit of vasodilatory and capillary leakage, activates some of the cough receptors and causes this dry cough. So you're going to see this primarily with ACE inhibitors, well as the prills. So lisinopril will be the answer there. All right, my friends, this covers the cases and this completes our lecture here on hypertensive medications. I really hope it made sense. I hope that you guys liked it. And as always, until next time.